Hello? What's up? Hey, Carl, what's up? All right, welcome to Group Chat Episode 6, presented by the best smelling salts for the most elite athletes, run through a wall smelling salts. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, the concept of this show is to be a hub for discussion of current snowboarding topics. We're going to talk videos, contests. We talk to everybody from riders, industry people. Uh, a lot of the topics are submitted by you guys via Patreon, so thank you to our Patreon members, and also via Instagram. Thank you to our sponsors, Oakley, Autumn, Mammoth, Element, Blackstrap, CB Days, Smith, and GoPro. And so in today's show, uh, we're going to have a call with X Games gold medalist Mia Brooks. We're going to talk product with Todd Richards. He has a great boot rant. Uh, we're going to talk about X Games, some locks open. We might even have a call from Red Gerard. We'll see. And in studio, we got Blake Paul, Russell Winfield, and Sam Taxwood. How we doing, gang? What's happening? We good, bro. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us, Chris. We're thrilled that you're here. And uh, Russ, you flew in for the from the day. I did from SoCal. From BroCal, yes, sir. Nice. How was the flight? Flight was nice. I got upgraded first class. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Had some orange juice while we we're still on the ground. Love that. Watched some weird British movie about a kid mm. trying to uh, he's trying to get some girls, so he started a band. It was cute. Nice. Great. Well, speaking of movies, we got a hard-hitting topic right out of the gate. This is from uh, Nikki Smalley. I think I butchered that IG name. Uh, favorite Denzel Washington movie of all time. I figured we'd get right into some great snowboarding topics. Who you got? What's your take? I'm going, uh, you know, maybe not the most popular one, but we just watched 13 Denzel Washington movies in a row on our last cool. trip. Uh, that was kind of spearheaded by Spencer. He just threw on uh, American Gangster, I think, and then we just kept next, next. But uh, Crimson Tide, I liked. Ooh. Summerine one. It's got Gene Hackman, Vigo Mortensen in there. Good. It's a nice, it's a wholesome tale, kind of suspenseful the whole time. Fully shot on a submarine, which you're like, is that going to be, like, exciting? And it was. Wow. Cheap set costs for that yeah. Uh, movie. Yeah. Uh, Sam, who you got? Uh, for me, it's just going to be a childhood classic, I guess, with uh, Remember the Titans. All right, Russ, who you got? <sighs> I'm going to have to go with Training Day, bud. Ooh, classic. You know. Classic. Just, I think that uh, it was great. Got me fired up. This is not an option, motherfucker. You're going to smoke this? Pretty much. Yeah, I like that. Well, I, I'm going to go ahead. This is an obvious one, American Gangster. Um instant classic also have a potential skit idea you know when they're uh bagging up all the coke and they're all naked i do yes uh, we i think we want to do that with smelling salts at the bomb hole so it's like uh just a bunch of naked dudes in the lobby uh bottling up smelling salts i think they need to all be dad dad bod plus <laughs> and harry <laughs> yeah it's kind of the I, only option yeah i think i made a new term up dad bod plus mm mhm Absolutely. All right. Well, let's just get into, um, you know, we had a ton of questions for everybody and a common theme was with Blake Paul and his recent switch to ride snowboards from GNU, from Mervin. Uh, let's just, let, let's give him a, let's give him a, let's give him a, whoops, wrong sound bite. Let's give him some applause. Okay. Um, we're going to pop some champagne to his new... Yeah, we're doing an official celebration. Hey! Whoa! whoa! Wow! That was Almost nice, came back at brother. Me. That there. definitely wasn't Ooh. as smooth as your snowboarding, Blake. Yeah, that was, a, okay. that was a high compression. I'm surprised the light didn't explode right there. Nice pop. There you go, yeah. Sammy. Thanks, It buddy. hit that rock star thing, too, I think, or something. Yeah, we might have lost some lumens ah. up top. Yeah, we, little, lumen counts down. A little recovery mimosa. Whoa. Did you get banged up last night, Sam? No. Just had a couple bevs with Jeff and Webb. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Got to the bottom. Got to the bottom of some just the world's issues. The premium orange juice over here. The eighteen ninety nine for this one. Wow. Yeah. Well, you, you know the contract's bad. good if you're buying the premium orange juice. You know if you're you're airlifting food from Erwan in LA, you're doing I right. mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Twenty dollar OJ. Yeah. Yeah. 
All Save right. your life, though. This stuff's good. Cheers, boys. Cheers, Cheers brother. Ooh, kind of shaky over here. Yeah. Cheers, fam. Cheers. Cheers. I got some coffee. I'll, I'll sip to that. I got some water. Ooh. Ooh. The Rockstar Recovery Mimosa really, really smacks. Mm. Yep. Does it hit? It hits. Yeet, yeet. All right, Blake, do you want to get into this new sponsor change? Yeah, you know, um, I guess I've been with, like, a lot of my sponsors for 10-plus years and definitely grateful for everything that Canoe provided for me and the opportunities and their family, still family, Pete and Jesse and Mike and the whole team, Forrest, Max, everybody over there. Um, but, you know, like... You snowboard your whole life, you ride for the same people for most of your career, a new opportunity arises and comes with just like all my friends are on ride and they have an awesome thing going, like their videos are amazing and um, products great and I was kind of just sussing out different options and ride came up and it just, it just like seemed like an authentic organic fit and just had to go for it basically, you know. Switch it up. New energy. It's like lighting a new fire in the career later down the line, which is awesome. Amazing. Now, a lot of questions, there's too many to even list, but people want to know about how the switch has been from riding your board at GNU that you've been on forever to testing new ride boards. Yeah, I think that's that's like an awesome opportunity for me as well. Like I get comfortable with what I'm riding and I like to just stick to it. Like you find something you like and you just stay on it. But this has provided like a good chance for me to like really dive into like the tech of snowboards and learn about it. Cause I'm always like explaining like, Oh, I want this feeling or I want it to do this, but I don't really know what makes that happen. Like specifically within the board. So luckily Jay stone, who's been on the show a bunch and he's just like the snowboard tech God has worked with me and we've done a bunch of different prototypes for a pro model that'll come out eventually. We don't have a date on it. So riding a bunch of different types of camber and side cut and flex and materials. And it, we've like, it's like fully educated me on how a snowboard works, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, I really like riding the algorithm. I've been on the deep fake a bit. I'm testing some camber. I'm testing some reverse camber. I'm testing, you know, a mixture of both. It's kind of just been all over the map. Like I ride like a different snowboard, like every week just to see what works best. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's really opened my eyes to be like, okay, like, let's, let me, like, educate myself a little bit here. Like, I'm not just a stunt man, but let's get behind the product and what it really does for you. I got a question to that, if you don't mind. <clears throat> so, Blake, do you think that now that you're more educated on the technical aspect of a snowboard, you can do different things with it? Like, will it help? Yeah, you know, like there's, you know, there's pros and cons to every tech. So you got like reverse camber helps you float in the powder. It's amazing. But that could be kind of like prohibiting you for landing and pow. You're just like, oh, well, like now I'm wheeling out of a lot of powder, but it's really fun when I'm on the resort. So we're working on something that's just kind of a nice blend of both. We want it to be like a super fun snowboard that everybody can ride and people can take on the resort and have a good time no matter your level or expertise but also it still needs to hold up you know in alaska or in the natural selection course or whatever so it's blending like high performance with like just your average snowboarder so what we're trying to do is just make something that kind of like it's like a quiver killer and it works for like freestyle fun snowboarding on powder days works in the park works wherever because it's nice to have a board that works for everything maybe it's not the best at one thing, but what well, I'm looking for just like fun resort riding, small features, and then when I go film, it still holds up, you know. Go. Oh. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break and do some general house cleaning for bomb hole stuff. Now, I first want to say thank you so much to all of our Patreon members. We couldn't do this show without you, and we appreciate your support. Now, another way to show support for the bomb hole, if you do not want to become a Patreon member is buying some merch. So all that stuff's available now at bombhole.com, and we appreciate you guys for listening. I think it's interesting to talk about this subject in general because you got a pro model board. Uh, Russ, you've designed snowboards. I've worked in the past to design snowboards. 
you know, Sam, what do you look for when you're designing a board? And what is the board that you ride with Nitro? You got a board, right? Uh, yeah, so the board I ride most is the Team Pro. Um, it's just kind of a across-the-board directional twin, um, progressive side cut. <clears throat> great in the PAL, great in the park, great in the half pipe. kind of just works everywhere. Uh, but, yeah, for me, I'm looking for a traditional camber, um, not crazy stiff, but on the stiffer side. And, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, similar to what Blake's saying, just like I'm always looking for a board that's going to be able to perf perform in kind of all terrain, I guess. Um, and I don't like to have to, like, switch to a PAL board, switch to a rail board, switch from, from board to board. So it's nice to have, like, that consistent uh, – yeah, that consistent ride, I guess. You ride the same board in the streets that you ride on backcountry jumps? Yeah, sometimes. Um, lately, though, I've been getting on Griff and Jared's board, the alternator in the backcountry if it's really deep, um, or maybe just resort riding. But over the years, like, I think I've kind of always just stuck to the team or the team pro, and those are both just, like, your pretty much standard freestyle shape. Um, but, yeah. ATVs. Yeah. What about you, Russ? Uh, I think, you know, it's funny across the board, we all, at least the three of us, like, I want one snowboard that works, right? Like, yeah. it's cool to have, like, the short wide and the swallow and the rail board, but in the end, <clears throat> I, got, I got into snowboarding because it was less stuff for me, right? Like, I don't have boots or big plastic boots and poles and two skis. I've got one snowboard with bindings attached to it and I can walk around. So for me, I want that. I just want one board that rips everywhere. It's uh, mostly traditional camber, a little bit of early rise in the nose and tail. And the reason for that is it allows me to ride a wider board, but still have the responsiveness of a narrower board, right? Um, because the contact points are up off. So when you go to initiate, you can roll it. And you don't have, like, this hook at the end. Um, and like Sam, you know, medium stiff. I don't need anything that's super, super stiff. It's just, it's not a lot of fun for me. It's like, you're, it's like it'd be like driving a Formula One car around on the street. It's yeah. just like, yeah, great, I can go a million, but it's just like I'm always on edge. So, you know, I'd like a... Tail shape. Right now, I ride a directional twin, but optimally, I'd like a different looking tail than a nose. Mm -hmm. Set back about an inch. Nice, great take. Uh, I, I got to talk to you about this, Blake, too, because you changed my whole perspective. I remember we were in the Millie lift line, and I was on your old GNU, and I was like, "Let me just strap into this thing," and it was it was soft, and I was just like, "Holy shit!" I've, I always came from the same old school mentality, like you want a big, stiff snowboard for powder, so you can land and go fast and attack the mountain. Man, that's just been kind of what I was raised on, I think. And then I get on Blake's board, and it's like it's pretty soft. It's pretty torsionally soft, from north to south soft. And and I think that there's something. I mean, I've said it on the show before, but I'm a big fan of sizing up. Like I ride a 164 Navigator in the powder, and it's like a noodle, but it's soft, and you can still maneuver it around. It seems like the boards that you're look, the feel you're looking for, is on the softer side of things, Blake. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the main thing I'm looking for is, like, responsiveness. Like, can I turn this thing on a dime? Can I do little checks in this, like, slow myself down quick? Can I, like, weave around this tree as quick as possible? Like, you see, like, a surfer, and he's it's just, like, it's, like, loose trucks on a skateboard or something, and that's what I'm looking for. But I think, like, honestly, you know, when you go to the hill and you see most people riding on a powder day or whatever – that are just like an average snowboarder, maybe 10, 20 days a year, their, their setup is like wrong. Like snowboarding, it came from like really stiff snowboards. It was like charge in, hit this cheese wedge, pop off the toes, like grab stale fish on a front side spin. You might get it around. And then it's like you're stomping it no matter what and you're just pointing it straight out of there. And I think like most people's setups are just wrong. Like, I don't know who's setting up people's boards. Like maybe they're not going to the right shop, you know, maybe they're not going to Milo, but uh, everybody needs to be a little bit set back, have a smaller stance, ride like a torsionally, at least torsionally softer snowboard, easier ed edge to edge. Like my parents got on like kind of a blend of reverse camber camber and they're like, they were in their sixties at the time and they just immediately switched and had so much more fun. So 
I think stiffness is like, it's great if you're riding Alaska, if you're riding big lines, choppy snow, you need it. But you can blend that with like a soft board. And if you're like riding bolts, if you're landing well, you're going to land it. Like you're going to be fine. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying new stuff. Like I like stiff boards for certain things. I like soft boards for certain things. So it's just finding that blend that works for you and your weight. And I'm pretty like light. Like I only weigh like 145. Damn, so kids I don't clocking in 145. So this is uh, I wanted to chime in and just say that Blake is uh, he's very light on his feet and literally just light. Um, Bird bones. I'm, I'm a stocky short meatball basically. So for me, <laughs> bit of a bulldozer. A, a, a bigger, stiffer board for me is great because I need all the help I can get out there. Whereas like Blake mm-hmm. is so light. And, like, his riding style and mine obviously are very different. Um, but I do totally understand, like, it seems like what you're saying, I think reverse camber is, like, a really good intro for people that are learning and getting into riding and just wanting to go and, like, rip around the resort totally. I would love to talk about the contrast between your guys' riding styles. This is a great topic because, um, you know, you have Blake, uh, some might call Gordon Lightfoot, uh, bird bones. <laughs> he's just kind of he's just floating on top of the snow like a feather. And then you have Sam, who is a bulldozer who has one speed and it's land at the fucking bottom and go huge or don't land. <laughs> but you're still at the bottom. <laughs> but you're go- yeah. you're you're like I'm gonna go straight and I'm gonna go big and that's how we're gonna do it. So I like talking about the boards to match your riding style. I think these two. It's like the two different kinds of peanut butter. It is okay. You got like the smooth. And the f- extra chunky. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, mean I don't know if we want to do. Bo- I don't know if we want to be body shaming Sam here. No, I mean, no, 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 right. no, 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 no. We're gonna get deeper into this body shaming as the <laughs> fucking podcast goes, bro. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, it's not body shaming. As a matter of fact, he's in good shape. If you see him on the on the road bike, he's lean. The kid's no, lean. The guy will ride from here to California. Yeah, him it's and true. Des. Yep. And, and I'm I'm saying that style wise, like snowboard style. Yeah. Yep. So when I had my who's next, the first question. Back in 1742, mm-hmm. when I got mine, um, they asked peanut butter style, smooth or chunky, mm-hmm. and I was like, chunky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's 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 not. It's Blake's has almost more of a organic almond butter type of situation. No, I think Blake's pr- like really oily peanut butter. It's <laughs> so smooth, <laughs> but it's like you just put the, the peanut butter on the bread and it spreads itself and it's perfect. You're like, huh? Thank you. Have you gotten a? Have you ever gotten a Natty Select invite, Sam? Nope. Uh, but but shout out to Natural Selection and Travis uh, and Liam. Those guys brought me out with Helene last year. I uh, happened to happened to be at the after party for the event at Revelstoke. And, yeah, it turns out if you hang out and have a good time with everyone, you may end up in a helicopter two Woo. days later with the crew. So, love yeah, that. that was cool. Yeah. yeah, I would love to see you in Natty Select. Are you doing, you're obviously doing Natty again, right, Blake? Yeah, yeah, we're doing it second week of March, I think, in Revelstoke. Got two courses, one off the resort, one heli. I think there's like a qualifier day, bunch of stuff built. Hopefully the first course is like similar to the Jackson course, which I think a lot of people are missing. A little more opportunity for freestyle compared to last year. So basically how it works for people that don't know, there's the duels for people that are new or that didn't make it past qualifying or to the finals or whatever, but since you're you're shoot in already because you did well last year. Yeah, like the duels, uh, if you win your duel and you go to do the contest, at least how it worked last year, you're kind of qualified for next year. Um, so there's always like 12 men, maybe eight women, I don't know for sure, um, that are kind of like on the tour, but then there's opportunity for new people to get on the tour through the duels. Mm. Now I have a question, like... Um, the the boards when you ride natural selection are you like in the past have you been riding inline snowboards that are like for sale or do you get special boards made um i was getting stiffer boards made to be completely honest um but i was also like stiffening my boards up every year as we worked on a pro model um but yeah i'd ride like a brand new board the contest day super kind of stiff as i can poppy when you're riding like deep snow steep terrain that's when you need that. When you're riding like flowy, fun, bright, and you might not need it a stiff board as much. I have a question. When you guys get a board, it's the board at day 40 is a lot different than the board at day one. 
do you ever think about, okay, right out of the package, this thing's a little bit stiff, but I know day five, day 10, it's going to start to feel buttery? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the board, but I mean, the ride boards have been holding up, like their pop holds up super well and they started out like too stiff, a couple of the models that I was riding and then I've broken into them and they've like felt a lot better. Um, so that's kind of new for me, but yeah, I mean, fortunately, like we're able to have the opportunity to go through a bunch of different snowboards and test them and like be able to bust a new board out and try it. So obviously like. If you go on, if you're doing like 50 days of chopped powder on a board, it's going to be like done. Like you know? Baker, like, Baker, you're going to break in a board. Quick. Yeah. Like even like a surfboard loses, like it's like skip and pop and whatever. Like everything has a life. Like once you get a brand new surfboard, it's like fast and floaty and poppy and you can tell. And it's the same with a snowboard. It's not like it's like a crazy difference, but yeah, I mean, brand new is kind of the, the go-to or like a week old. All right. Let's talk headwear. We're going to talk Autumn. Autumn's a great company. Let me tell you why. Brad Alban runs it. He is a gem in the snowboarding community. Done a lot of really cool things. And also, Lil Jeff. Lil Jefe. Absolute legend in snowboarding. So good people doing a good brand. Uh, at Autumn, their motto is Style Matters. So they have all different types of styles of beanie. They got the deep resi fit. We call it the surplus fit. They got the shorty fit. which You might, you might catch Silk D wearing more of a fisherman's friend, shallow fit. And they got the simple fit, which is right in between. They got all different styles of beanies, and they also have riders with impeccable style. You might catch Danimals, Cannon Cummins running on them. Everybody knows their style's amazing. So if you want to support a great company and you want a great beanie, they do our beanies. They do the run-through-a-wall beanie and then our other all-over print beanie. Um, and they're just I can't speak highly enough about the quality of the stuff they make. So check out autumnheadwear.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order. Again, autumnheadwear.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. Get yourself a nice piece of headwear. All right, let's talk about Oakley. They got their new team collection that has dropped. I've seen Sage Kotzenberg running his kit. It's fresh. It's yellow with some kind of olive green, and it hits. He's got the matching goggle. No, Stale's got his kit as well. So if you're looking for a new, fresh outerwear kit, check out the Oakley Team Collection. And they have new innovation in their helmets. I run an Oakley helmet. They have the Oakley Mod 3. It's got great venting so your goggles don't fog. Great helmet-to-goggle integration. They just pair up nicely. I run the Line Miner Pro. It pairs nicely with your helmet. So be sure to check out that Oakley Mod 3 and the new innovation that they put in that. And then they're also doing their Oakley Community Days this winter. And be sure to check their website as they announce days of when and where that's coming. It's really fun. They bring out their whole team, all kinds of heavy hitters. Last year they had Stolly Sandback and Sage and Patty. And Yuki Kadono was there. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great squad. So be sure to check out Oakley Community Days as they announce the dates. All right, quick disclaimer. Uh, we just had to reset everything because we were having some audio issues. I don't know if you guys noticed uh, Blake and Sam were sounded a little bit quiet. We got it dialed. Also forgot to mention, Silk D is not here. He's sick. So it's a couple of idiots trying to figure out how to run this thing, and we're lost without Silk. So um, You know what Silk would say about that? What's that? It ain't my fault. Wow. Well, you want to explain that reference to the listeners? Well, you know, being the age I am, I've been privy to a lot of years, multiple decades of, of a genre of music called hip hop, Chris. Yep. And back in the, I'd say, 90s, mm -hmm. there was a group of gentlemen, Yep. 504 boys, Ooh. led by none other than Master P. <laughs> yeet, yeet. And one of the artists was Silk the Shocker. Wow. We should maybe see if he wants to change his name. I mean, as long as he knows it's there. I think How is the spelled? Probably D A. Duh. Okay. It was and it's duh. S L Y K. Oh, I mean, he S could use that. I kind of okay. like that. Yeah, and he's or S Y L K. My silk bad. Duh. Dyslexia. Well, he's Silk D too, so that's that's nice. Yeah. I like that. Okay, you learn something new every day. I was a big Master P guy back in the day. We're gonna get into Nitro Turbo Takes presented by Nitro. Welcome to Nitro Turbo Takes! Brought to you 
by Nitro Snowboards and Canoe Alliance. Nitro Snowboards has been building snowboard products, boards, boots, and bindings for over 34 years and has one simple mission to inspire people to get out and go snowboarding and support their local and global community by supporting the shops, the organizations, and the people who are dedicating their lives to this. Snowboarding is what got us here, and giving back to snowboarding is what keeps us here. The deeper the layers, the better the cake. Just like the snowboarding community, this season Nitro is releasing a two-part film project, Layers, The Unintentional Culture of Snowboarding, a full-length 80-minute documentary exploring the different layers of the snowboard community around the world. All right, so normally the way this works uh, is that Silk reads them, but since he's not here, I'm going to read them. Also, these questions are submitted by Knut Eliasson, k uh, Sam's team manager. He's more, than a, he's more than a team manager, though. Shout out, Knut. Shout out. Major shout out to Norway's Knut. One of Norway's finest. Okay, first question is for myself. Chris, in your opinion, what's the biggest gimmick in snowboarding right now? Uh, you know... I would just say maybe like faux tech. I think that a lot of brands like try to build these crazy tech stories around products and like all these crazy like gimmicky selling points. And you know, if you're if you're gonna buy a snowboard, just go demo a bunch and pick one that you enjoy riding because the the stat sheet on a snowboard has nothing to do with the way it rides. You know, you you'll, you're never gonna really know if you love a snowboard unless you. Unless you ride it down the hill, even if you think you love the thing from reading all the specs on it, just go demo a board because that's when you're going to know if you love it or if you don't love it. And if you're riding a board, if it's not an absolute fuck yes, it's a no. You know what I mean? Like that should be your mentality when you're buying riding a board. Just find the one that you love. Okay, that's I'm done with that rant. Blake, who is the first pro you ever met? Uh, Jackson Hole Mountain Resort actually did a ride with the pros day. And I got to ride with Travis Rice and Brian Gucci when I was super young. Whoa. Yeah, we all. Super mellow. Yeah, Easy. pretty crazy. There's like a photo of like the three of us and I'm like, I don't know, 10, 11 or something like that. Just Like 5'11", 5'12", <laughs> almost six feet. <laughs> just chilling with those two, taking gondola laps on a powder day, just not even knowing how insane that was until I look back now. But yeah, pretty crazy. Psycho. Russell. Yes. What was your first snowboard shop? Well, that's, it depends. Are we talking about the first place I bought a snowboard or the first shop sponsor? I mean, these are asked by Canute, so you take them how you want. Do, okay. Why don't you answer both? The first uh, shop that I bought a snowboard at was Sunsport in Old Greenwich, Connecticut. And my first shop sponsor was Rick's Surf City in Ooh. Milford, Connecticut. Shout out to Rick. Put me on. Okay, this one's for Concrete Sneaks. How many chairlifts have you put in? Uh, I've been a part of the construction of, I believe, four different chairlifts. Ooh. Oh, Shout out Doppelmeyer. Okay, this is for everybody. How do we get more kids into snowboarding? One sentence limit. Russ? <sighs> access. We just need more access. Probably cheaper product, more kids' product. There's not a ton of kids' product out there. I'm going to concur with both of you. Uh, <laughs> more access to the hill and, yeah, easier access easier access to uh, these products that, that we that are necessary to snowboard. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like what you said. I, I think uh, maybe also cheaper lift tickets could help as well. Yep. Uh, that's my answer. Next question, Sam. What's up with the cowboy hat? Um, good question. That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. I've been listening to a lot of country music over the last few years. I kind of really have no answer other than it. You know, sometimes sometimes it just feels right, and you just you know want to listen to some Alan Jackson, pop a top again. I don't know. Yeah, I don't really have a solid answer other than uh, yeah, it's fun to wear it. Sometimes and, you gotta uh, look different than everybody else. And also, you know, I feel like snowboarding is maybe not the same as riding a bull or a horse, but you know, you, you similar vibe. You know, you're risking the bod, putting it all out there. <laughs> Fuck it, having a rootin' tootin' good time. <laughs> exactly, amazing. 
Okay, Blake, uh, what is snowboarding missing right now? Oh, man, I was prepped for this question to say access, but since we already covered it, I guess I could choose like a more lighthearted answer. Maybe, um, you know, it'd be cool to see more kids coming up, um, just kind of getting in the backcountry more, like more girls and guys, like maybe just skipping the whole contest thing and just go right towards the backcountry. Like, why not? Like, we were discussing it last night, Chris, like there's been like a fall off of like younger riders that are like backcountry riders only. And I feel like there's a space for that. Like I love street snowboarding. I love to watch it. I'm not hating on street snowboarding or contest snowboarding or anything, but I feel like why is there not like a younger generation that just rides powder that's just doing it that way? Um, you know, we got Cannon Cummins. There's people coming up for sure, but I feel like there's a, there's a space for that. Great answer. Yeah. That's, a, that's my favorite answer on this thing I think we've gotten. Uh, Sam, why do you ride for a brand like Nitro? Uh, dude, Nitro is a family brand. and I know that everyone likes to talk about their sponsors like it's a family, but uh, legitimately uh, I've been riding for Nitro for 15, 15 plus years now. And yeah, I don't know. It's just a really small, tight-knit group of people. And I have... Uh, yeah, I just call that place home. Like, I really appreciate the amount of years and time and everything that they've put into my career. And I hope that uh, they feel the same about what I've given back to Nitro just because, yeah, I don't know. It's tough uh, these days having a hard goods brand supporting you like Nitro. And, uh, yeah, I just feel very fortunate. And, yeah, just stoked to be a part of the family. Next question is for me. It's uh, who is winning natural selection. Now, uh, obviously, we got Blake in studio, big fan, not going to pick Blake. Um, oh, so <laughs> wow. I would love to see it. Would love to see it. I'm not, but like, I'm a gam- if I'm a gambling man, if I'm a gambling, it's, it's who do we think? I mean, everybody loves, you know, it's like you, Travis is, he's, Travis is an animal. You, once you get to Alaska and then Zoe is proven, you know, Travis and Zoe. Um, but I'm actually going to go curveball. I'm going to go Colonel Kotzenberg, a.k.a. Sage, and Zoe. That's that's my uh, final answer. But why don't we just kind of hijack this and everybody gives their natural selection takes. I'm going with my man, Blake. No Got to support him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, I, I mean, I, I do need the Tom Brady slash Michael Jordan, so I'm going with Zoe yep. on the other side. Like Zoe's going to be a landslide. That's a shoe-in for me, I guess. That's that's my vote. Um I'm going to go Mickle. Woo! Ooh, curveball. Bang, bang. Wild card. Now, the question is, Blake <laughs> is competing. What is his answer for who's going to win? Mm, I'm kind of – I'm a fan of Ben Ferg. I, feel I like, like Ferg, too. I feel yeah. like Ben Ferg, like, he hasn't had his true moment at yeah. the contest yet. He's He's got it all. He's a full package. And, <laughs> you know – Elena Height's been ripping. She gives Zoe a run for her money. Yeah. Um, you know, Emma Crosby's going to do a duel. You never know who could kind of sweep in and take it for the women. Um, it'd be cool to see someone different. I love Zoe, too. It's tough. Those are good takes. I like it. Next question. Russell, what does a perfect day of snowboarding look like for you? Well, uh, I think there's many different perfect days of snowboarding, but the most recent perfect day for me snowboarding uh, was in Japan about a couple weeks ago. And it wasn't even, it was just, it's for me, like, and I, I said this last time, snowboarding to me is only 5% of snowboarding, if you know what I'm saying, like the actual act of strapping in. For me, it's more about like the laughing in the gondola or the chair and making that heel side turn that's just you're going a hundred and you just sink it in and you yuck and then come up and you're like you're blind but you don't care, right? Yeah. And then you pop out and your friend gets one and white rooms you and you guys get to the bottom and it's just you're like, this is it. Like for for that two minutes, there's no care about anything. It's just pure enjoyment. So any day where that happens. And it can be in the park. It can be a powder day. It, it, it doesn't matter. It can be in Vermont. It can be in Alaska, right? Like, it's, it's, it's the camaraderie for me, really. Great answer, Russ. Great answer. Yep. Sam, 
What makes a good video part? Personality, I think, uh, is every bit of a video part. That's that's kind of all. Like I think about uh, Jonas Michalot and Jake Oe. Those two just like stand out for me huge as far as personality goes in old like video grass parts. Meyer, like yeah, I don't know, just the whole collective. It's like a yeah personality. I think is what creates a beautiful video part. What about what about good tricks? Uh, do they play a factor? Yeah. But nah. <laughs> <laughs> I think personality plays into the good tricks, right? Style I mean, I, is part of the I personality. Guess the reason why I went with personality is because it's almost just a given that everyone's trying to do their best and push themselves and try some scary shit every time. Um, but I do think the parts that stand out the most usually are the ones that, you know, you can just really see the like who the person is through that part and... I don't know. They they usually stick in your head a bit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great answer. Okay, uh, this might be the dumbest question in the history of hot takes ever or from uh, Nitro Turbo Takes. Knut, um, he asked, what would you rather see, a McTwist or a Crippler? I mean, to me, this the answer is kind of obvious Mc, on this. McTwist. <laughs> McTwist. McTwist, like, done well, tweaked with, you know, Japan. So Russ? I think we spoke about this a little bit. Um in the era that I come from, like snowboarding was really monitored by snow, like the core of snowboarding, right? So obviously, I, I'm a I'm a McTwist guy, like a tight mute, or even like an indie where you get upside down and maybe eat on the way back down, just something that's got you know got some drip, you know, some sauce to it, and really clean. But I think uh, in today's world. Kids are, are running the cripplers, man, and you know it's it's cool. It's evolution of of our uh, our uh, sport, I guess culture. Yeah, I, I think yeah, McTwist, uh, timeless. I think cripplers are just maybe because they're the easiest thing yeah, to do ever. Uh, it's yeah. a straight air. It's basically yeah, easier than it, a frontside air. Yeah, it's a straight like I don't know. At least for me in the half pipe, if I'm trying to go as big as I can, I think I would probably do a crippler before a straight air probably. Yeah, and then you have also, but people are making them look good. Too. Like there's crippler tail grabs, crippler nose grab, crippler sailfish. Yeah, like you can make a crippler look good, but it's hard to compete with a McTwist. Um, okay, this is a question for everybody: Olympics or X Games? So maybe it would be: Would you rather compete, or I guess I, I don't know how you take that, but Olympics or X Games? Natural selection. Woo! Like that. Like that. For me. I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and field this one. Uh, I mean, I'm going to go Olympics because you're an Olympian. You represent your country. Like, l I, I have an X Games gold medal. Like, they give them to pretty much anybody these days. It's if not, you got one. It's not that hard to get. Like, they give them to the photographers for photos. You know, you can kind of you can kind of you can kind of get one of those <laughs> pretty easy. Uh, but Olympics, you're you're kind of like royalty for life if you get it. You represent your country. It's it's great. So that's. Um, if I was going to win a gold in one of those, I'd say Olympics. I'm going to go Olympics as well. Um, yeah, I disagree with you fully. And I don't know, across the board just seems like the judging is crazy everywhere. And so you might as well, if you're going to win a medal, might as well be the one for their, the, the highest achievement, I guess, as far as medals go. Yeah, Olympics is going to bring the most success to your career. Yep. Yep. Okay, Silk, uh, who's not here. Who has the best kit today? Chris, Sam, Russell, or Blake? Uh, since Silk's not here, why don't we ask Jules, actually? Jules! Jules! Uh, Silk's not here. We got to know who's got the best kit today. You got to open the door and tell, talk about the kit. Minus Blake's hair. Blake's hair doesn't get to play a part. Who's got the best kit? I mean... I know I'm not really in the running, so I'm just going to keep sitting down. Russ has got the most expensive kit. You didn't even show I the mean, Supreme. Yeah. Can we agree it's Russ? You got the distressed jeans. It's, it's Russ, yeah. right? It's yeah, that's yeah, Russ. Yeah. Russ, you take this one, man. Yeah. When, Sam you know, had the, when Sam had the cowboy hat on, thank you, Jules. Thanks, Jules, he was, for telling the truth. When Sam had the cowboy hat on, it was, he was maybe could be considered. Yeah. It was just bumping into the memorabilia back here, and <laughs> I'm not really trying to knock off. a bunch of shit off the shelf. So I was trying to balance it the whole episode. Yeah, yeah. I put it on the shelf. 
Well, we got some good moments with that. Okay, uh, another topic. All right, that was thank you, Canute, for those questions for Nitro Turbo Takes. That was great. Uh, also, I heard that uh, Baker recently canceled the bank slums. You guys hear that? I did. You it guys was... have any thoughts on that? To the northwest, baby. Atmospheric rivers hitting, brother. Yeah, there's another one coming up. They're gonna hit, get hit with another one. Rivers are flowing down the mountain. You see, uh, Brandywine is just a river right now. Yes. Yeah. Like the river is very apparent. Should we get into just the global snow report real quick, Blake? Yeah, I mean, I'm checking weather every day, like six times a day, all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's like what else? Do you, that's like part of like what you have to do all winter. It's crazy. Um, it's part of that contract. Yeah, I was looking this morning. Actually, I think a resort in South Lake Tahoe's got the top global forecast for the next 10 days. It was like China Peak or something at like 94 inches for the next 10 days. Whoa. So Tahoe and Mammoth are sitting pretty. They're about to get it, you know, as it makes sense. California is getting all the rain. Tahoe's getting it. We're not looking too bad in Utah. I think we got... Got four inches last night. I went up and rode today. It was dense. It was pretty fun, a little scratchy. Um, but we got like maybe another six coming and then maybe about 20 inches coming next week. So that should be good. Pretty much all, like anywhere people have been snowboarding this year has been Japan, Oslo. There was an early Stockholm trip. We went to Europe. We got it done, but it wasn't the best conditions. Um, it's a... It's a weird winter, you know. Last year in Utah was insane. This winter, stay vigilant. Mm -hmm. Keep your eye on it. You can only be spoiled like that so many times. Yep. And also, I think East Coast, they got hammered for a quick storm early. That melted. Um, so that was that came and went. Uh, but, yeah, pretty much Japan is... Yeah, Japan's a go-to, which I don't think they had a good winter last year. And then COVID, people weren't there. So, you know, it was time for a, a revival of everybody to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. They needed financial gains over there from the tourism board. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the Mint tours definitely helped that wow. single-handedly. I mean, everybody. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out to the Mint tour. Riders are tagging Mint tours more than their sponsors. <laughs> I mean, I guess that might be their sponsor. Yeah, yeah, for like what, ten percent off a hotel room? Oof. <laughs> some Sh some shots be, fired. Some <laughs> homies got the full hookup. Our crew didn't, you know, but we really appreciate uh, the accommodation and the stay that we had there in Japan. And uh, yeah, I don't know, like, were we fighting over terrain with like eight other crews, one hundred percent? But we had a great stay, and uh, yeah, just I don't know. Yeah. What are you? What are you supposed to do? Like, I'll retract I, that statement. I might go to Japan. I love you guys. Mentors are the best. <laughs> Shout out mentors. I can, at mentors. At mentors. Yeah. I can tell you that my Japan trip was uh, way different than I'm used to. Okay. There was a Louis Vuitton store in our hotel. Wow. Yeah. What's going on with that? I. <laughs> you get anything? Dope. You cop something? They actually kicked me out. No way. <laughs> Because I had a, I had a coffee with me, and they were like, "No," I was like, "Oh, okay." They hit you with the X. Yeah, they were, yeah. You see, you definitely know. No. 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 So you went to Japan this year. Yep. You went to Japan, and you went to Europe this year. Yep. yep. Nice. Okay. I have a question. So this is the, the question we get a lot, and we've never really sunk our teeth in this question. I think it's great for the listeners. We are snobs. We're prima donnas. We've flown all over the world and snowboard on other people's dimes. So we have a lot of data in this department. A lot of it's for filming, so it's a little bit biased, but if you guys were to purely recreationally go snowboarding and you're looking for the best experience in the world out of all your travels, where are you going? Well, first thing I'm going to do is call Blake. To find out the snow <laughs> report. Smart. No, for real. This is what people I'm I'm giving people the the the, yeah. the way to do this. You find out where the best snow is, and then from there, you know, if it's in Europe, then maybe you go to Lux, right? If Swiss is hitting. If it's in Japan, if you want like mellow, pretty sick cruisers, you go to Nseiko. If you want to get Nar buckets, you go to Hakaba, right? Or if it's here in the States, you figure out where. So I, I get asked this question a lot, and I'm always like, well, it's condition depending. Because I don't want to go to, like, St. Moritz if it hasn't snowed in two months. Like, it's, it's not going to be cool. So it's, you know, snow reports, baby. That's good. So it's conditional. Okay, let's just say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just cancel that out and, ma and make this question easy for you. 
everywhere in the world has perfect conditions and it's firing and it's prime time and you're catching it good, where are you going? Alaska. Elaborate. I mean, if you're like an intermediate advanced snowboarder or you've ridden powder and you enjoy sustained steepness, I think the hardest thing about riding powder at resorts is most resorts are pretty flat or if they're steep, they get bumped out pretty easily and it takes a lot of snow to make it bottomless powder. But Alaska, you're riding like your normal resort lap anywhere in the world, like six times on one run with like different terrain. You got blower power at the top. You might have slush at the bottom. Like it's definitely the best if, uh, if you're not like a powder snob and you're not looking to just like get the sustained steep powder. Um, I was just in Chamonix and I've been like four times and it's like the most beautiful place ever. If you're like opera, fun vibes, look at views, cruise down some, they got great groomers there. They know what they're doing with their groomers in Europe way better than here. So another great spot for just vibe and so scenery. Sh- Chamonix or AK? Yeah. G- great answer. Fuck it, this is biased, but uh, I'm just going to say Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. You can ride Snow Basin, Brighton, Snowbird. You got three really good resorts, like, and that's three to, that I'm naming off the top of my head, Powder Mountain. Um, yeah, I don't know. Bang for your buck is great, and, yeah, if conditions are dope, you kind of can't go wrong. Aside from the crowds these days, that's kind of, like, all you're fighting. But, yeah, if we're talking perfect conditions, maybe – that means no lines. Um, but, yeah, I, I would say Utah. Blake took AK out of my head, so. Yep. Well, <laughs> I'm going to probably have to uh, – one of the icon resorts worldwide, maybe Niseko. With, you know, if I'm bringing my lady, we'll go to Niseko, stay at, you know, Hanazono, that nice place where I was just at. It's beautiful, and it's, a, it's like back to my same stupid thing. The actual act of snowboarding is only a part of, like, snowboarding for me. So it's a lot, a lot of the extracurricular stuff, you know, the onsens, the little hole-in-the-wall ramen spots, like, out of town, the, just the beauty of, of the mountains and, the, and the, the, the experience of the culture. Yeah, Japan's got that magical, not just the snowboarding, but the whole experience. Yeah. I like it when you bring the whole experience factor in, like Blake's talking about Chamonix, the Apre scene's hidden. You go to Japan, the 7-Eleven's hitting, wild. Bro. It's hitting. You know, the food's hitting, the experience is hitting. You know, one, one you know, really great experience for people looking is, you know, the cat skiing operations, cat snowboarding, like, for example, Bald Face Lodge, if you have the opportunity to do that, or a heli, a heli lodge like Eagle Pass, I've never been, but I'd imagine, you know, that you're eating great food, you're getting heli bumps, you're hanging out in the lodge, good camaraderie, you know, it's, it's private, untracked, they kind of, they, they take the slopes and they, you know, only hit them piece by piece so there's guaranteed powder. You know, they leave stuff unridden. So uh, a lot of the, the the cat operations I think are really good. But for me, you know, to be totally honest, I'm a kind of an ADD type of person. Like, I like to just go. Like, I get excited. I just want to boom, boom, boom. So I'm more into, like, snowmobile bumping. And, like, if you're just taking hot laps and you're just snowboarding with the snowmobile, you're just getting runs because you're just boom, right back to the top, and you're shuttling your friends. But final answer funnest place for me i swear to god like a fun rope tow resort on a slushy day with a good crew and the way my brain works i just get excited oh i i got something for you on the rail and you're seeing your buddy and you're right back to the top and you don't have time to overthink it and you're just the whole thing's exciting and you're never not in it you're never not in it and so i you know i love riding powder love riding park but i swear i've had probably the funnest times on my snowboard riding small rope tow resorts nice yeah yeah, I agree. If you've <clears throat> never experienced the Midwest snowboard scene uh, and you're a snowboarder, you have to go check it out at a certain point because, yeah, it's it's a whole different thing. There's places like even like Jackson, though, too, which I left out is like Jackson. You could ride Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, insane mountain. You could go cat skiing at Grand Targhee. You could do a heli day. You could like mix it all up. That's if you have the opportunity to do all that. You can 
kind of take everything that we just said, find a location and kind of make it happen too. For sure. Yep. Good call. Some good intel for the people. So uh, still coming up in the show, we got a call with Mia Brooks. We have a chat with a pre-recorded chat with uh, Todd Richards. We might be calling Red Gerard. We're going to talk X Games. Uh, we still got tons of stuff to talk about. But before we do, uh, we're actually doing a giveaway for Nitro that spawned between our group <laughs> text last night with uh, Blake and Sam. And I found Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. My idea, for sure. Yep. Yeah, this is Sam's idea. <laughs> so what happened was I was looking through photos. I found this photo of Sam, a uh, screenshot from his Instagram of him riding down the sand dunes shirtless with his hands behind his back. And his ste is amazing. He literally looks like, you know, Jerry Lopez at Pipeline. He's just, like, hands behind his back, just surfing the sand, shirt off, it's just hair flowing like the salmon of the Capistron in the wind. So um, Blake and I went through a series of kind of those, those quick Photoshops you can do on your phone. So the first one I did, I thought, well, let's, let's have Sam uh, shirtless on a snowboard going down El Toro. So that was our first one. And then I sent uh, Pyramid Gap, him, ga- him doing Pyramid Gap. And then Blake banged us over the head. He switched his stance to regular, yeah. and he ollied Carl's bad gap. So switch <laughs> ollie. Image, yeah, switch yeah. ollie. And then I think Sick. Uh, he has an image. What is that photo? Uh, the, art, the art museum. The one in the Louvre. Oh, uh, yeah. Got him in the Louvre. We put him with the Forum 8. <laughs> yep. And then I had him doing a Big Mountain line with uh, really gnarly spine. He was riding with Big Mountain Jeremy Jones. Oh, yeah, the Himalayan one. Yeah, that yep. one was nuts. That was uh, my favorite one, I think. Yep. We also had him at Pipeline uh, catching a wave. Um, we had him with the Mount Rushmore, the Mount Taxwood more. Mount Taxmore. Yeah, Mount we just Taxmore. moved into, like, Googling most popular photos. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, Sam with the Iwo Jima flag. He's actually present with them pushing the flag up. Uh, there's also Sam, Man on the Moon, and then the Sam la- on the Moon. Sam on the Moon, and then the last one I have is uh, with Ali, uh, the famous knockout photo, and Sam is knocked out. Um, so basically, what we're gonna do is a giveaway. We're gonna give away a Nitro board. They're gonna deal with this. Uh, Photoshop Sam sandboarding, which uh, we'll have the photo. You can find it somehow uh, on Instagram. So what you're saying is you're asking people to continue to roast me? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the Sweet. best one, Sweet. tag Nitro, tag Bombhole, the best Photoshop of Sam sandboarding shirtless will win a Nitro snowboard. Good and, to hear. Yep. So we just came up with that on the spot. Yeah. Does Nitro know about that? Yes. I, t- I called little Jeff. He green-lighted it. Okay, good. That's, that's a good call. All right. Let's take a break and talk about one of my favorite places, Mammoth Mountain. Now, they got... Over 140 features in their Unbound Terrain Parks. They got some of the best park builders on Earth. They got 10 parks, 100-plus rails, 40-plus jumps at any time, and a mini pipe, a mega pipe, which is 22 feet, and countless transition features. Now, let's talk main park. Now, that's where I love to ride. Uh, I was just there earlier this winter. The jumps are incredible. You're talking good takeoffs, good landings, It makes you feel like you're a better snowboarder than you are. Some of the best snowboarders in the world have really sharpened their teeth there, like Dusty Hendrickson, Judd Henkes. A lot of the best half-pipe riders train there in the world to ride their super pipe. They got South Park, which is really fun and flowy. You got Forest Trail. That's a good warm-up. Some smaller features. You might catch some old heads in there. You might catch Todd Richards banging him over the head with a cab five. You never know. And then the mountain itself is incredible. If you get you catch it on a powder day and you know where to go, you can get rowdy. And then if you just want to rip groomers, you got yourself a nice directional board and you want to lay down some carbs. It's a great place. They got beginner parks. They got intermediate parks. Mammoth Mountain has a ton of terrain for any ability level. Great place to go if you want to have a vacation and get into some snowboarding. So highly recommend Mammoth Mountain. If you're looking for a vacation, check it out. All right, let's talk Smith Optics. Now, there's been a lot of hype around Smith's line of the imprint 3D goggles that are custom made for each rider's face. The technology is the first of its kind, providing the best possible fit and optical experience. Smith just released two new additions to the collection, the 3D Squad and the 3D Squad XL. The first you'll notice is the goggles fit perfectly to your face with less foam bulk. The precision fit eliminates common issues like wind gap, light leaks, 
and gets rid of the pressure around your temples and nose bridge. They also integrate perfectly with Smith helmets. The result is an improved riding experience with an increased all-day comfort and an expanded field of view without altering the frame design or lens profile. Check them out at smithoptics.com. I just did the face scan. Mine are on the way. It was really easy. But again, check them out at smithoptics.com. Speaking a little, Jeff, uh, what's up with that wakeboard slam? Yes. Oh. Dude. Epic clip. Yeah, that uh, one kind of slept on. We we were doing like a nitro spring shoot out in Austria two, like, yeah, two, two springs ago. And uh, Jeff and his crew of people that he was like traveling with, they went from Innsbruck to where we were snowboarding, which is like an hour and a half drive. And on the way there, there's this uh, this wake park. It's one of those parks where they like you hold onto the cable and you just kind of go around in, in loops and they have features and shit. But I guess uh, <laughs> when you go around one of the corners, you got to like, I'm not sure if you're supposed to be on the inside so you don't like if there's slack, basically it just will like yank you. And, and Jeff took this corner the wrong way <laughs> and gets absolutely <laughs> annihilated on this corner in one of those wake parks. And I think Sean Miskiman posted this clip to uh, like bodies hit the floor. And yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty iconic clip. Uh, yeah, I think Liam Brearley and, and yeah, Liam was with him actually and like was kind of giving them the, the lowdown. But yeah, I, I really wish I was there to watch it in person. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be sure to loop that. Silk, when you edit this, make sure you loop the clip of little Jeff uh, getting bodied bodies on the screen the flow, as well. But this is a good segue. Let the bodies in the flow. <laughs> Wakeboarding in snowboarding. Let, let's, let me just provide a little bit of context. Liam Brearley, he just won uh, Locks Open Slope Style, took the world by storm. I'm going to be honest with you, didn't really know much about the kid before this. Uh, put it down for Locks Open deep bag of tricks, then went to knuckle huck, one knuckle huck. It almost feels like a slight overnight sensation situation for, for, for my eyes at least. And we looked into his gram, don't know much about the kid, saw some insane wakeboard footage. He's going back rodeo, front board, 450 pretzel on a wakeboard. Have you guys seen the clip? Yeah. That's insane. It's insane. A so, lot of movement. So we're seeing, I feel like snowboarding used to be Wait, uh, skateboarding influence. You know, you got to look like a skateboarder. And yep. now you're seeing Zeb Powell's got some wake vibes going on. Yeah. Liam Brearley's got wake. What's going on? Are the wakeboarders taking snowboarding by storm? Where are we at with this? I I don't know that they're taking snowboarding by storm. <laughs> um, I think that it's it's the evolution of the sport. Like when I was really, you know, in in the front seat of the sport, we there there were rules. And they were really stringent, right? But now it's like everybody, and which is awesome. Everybody's welcome. Do your thing. Do it how you do it, you know. And so that's allowing different people to like branch out and actually try different stuff. Whereas we, it was it was the way you did a certain trick, right? Like you have your ten tricks that you're allowed to do, and the to differentiate is the st- your style within that trick, right? And now it's just like people are doing huge flyaways. I, I mean, really, they're just rippy flips, right? Like Crippler rippy flip, whatever it is. It's 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 a back Louis or two with a bunch of spins, right? Um, which is I can't do it, right? Like I'm yeah, not, it's like I'm, anything goes these days yeah. with like tricks, with how you snowboard, with your style, where you draw your creativity and inspiration from like what else you do off your snowboard and I mean it's rad it's like uh, snowboarding is all subjective it's all perspective it's all opinion and you can draw your, like you can be drawn to some person for some reason and somebody else to another reason but it's kind of like I feel like it used to be like oh you don't skate but you snowboard but now it's just like do whatever you want everything's good to go if you're having fun do it yeah. just like let it fly. Anything I'm into it. like people are gonna hate on it. People are gonna hate on the like the cool core kids. People are gonna hate on the contest kids. It's just like just do whatever. If it's if it's like come if it's like out of your heart and it's authentic, then it's I'm gonna in. show, and that's all that matters. That's it. Great take. Yeah, I think it's apparent when you're enjoying yourself and having fun. And yeah, I, I don't know. There's there's no there's there's no knocking it. 
until you try it and everyone's getting their fix from somewhere and like yeah our inspiration's drawn from so many different places like Blake is saying and you were saying Russell but uh yeah I think the homies that come off of wakeboarding have crazy air awareness and they're strong as fuck yes and I envy that so yes yeah, yeah kudos to the fucking G's I mean um, imagine that having to be pulled by a a, a wire going yeah, like yeah. 35 miles per hour so yeah. not only are you flipping and spinning and trying to grab onto this thing attached to your feet, but you're also holding onto a wire and a handle that's dragging you over the wall. Like, that's yeah. crazy. Can we also talk about a huge factor in there? Is there's no land? You land flat. Uh, every single time. All you do is land flat. These these fools are strong, bro. Yeah. Like, Jeff didn't know that you could let go of the wire, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. I'll cue, the, dragon. I'll cue the clip. Gesme sends me a clip. Probably, I'd say, on rotation every few months. And it's uh, a wakeboarder who is, he's board sliding the snow, like he's doing like a heel slide drag. And he intentionally scorpions. And it's right when the beat drops. So we'll be sure to include that clip. It's phenomenal. Uh, but going back to what we just talked about, we have a question on Instagram from JustinLure.art. Has core snowboarding died? No. No, I mean, there's always going to be a core aspect to snowboarding, to anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know why someone would think that, I guess. But, I mean, and, unless you're only watching X Games in the Olympics, maybe you would think that. But uh, if you know where else to look within the industry, yeah. I would say it's the opposite. It's thriving. I think that uh, our sport, our culture is growing. And I'm hyped on that, right? And so it might not be as easy for somebody to find. But in this day and age where all you need to find something is one of these, it's like, come on, man. Like, just look a little harder. Yeah. Like, you know, there's, there's plenty of media publications and outlets the bomb hole, right? If you're, if you're watching this or listening to this and you're asking me, or any of us, of course, snowboarding has died. Really? Like, is that, like, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I would say that Blake and Sam and Chris are, are core snowboarding, right? Yeah. Core is just an over term, like, overused term. Like, yeah. it's like a marketing term at this point. Like, everyone's like, oh, yeah, well, how are we doing in the core? Like, it's, just like, <laughs> it's just like dumb. It's like dumb to even say core now. And so it's like, there will be people that snowboard for the right reasons, snowboard for themselves. The people, the most core people are the people that go up, snowboard on powder days, don't post it, leave. Like, yeah, buy all their get stuff. Get it, get like 100 yeah. days on hill, buy stuff. Like, Tonino, see him up there, ripping power, Brighton, like Seth up there every day. Like, it's just people that love it the most, that are into the product, that are fans of it, that snowboard for themselves and aren't necessarily like, I'm up here, like, oh, I got to get my next thing, whatever. Like, that's core to me. Like, the consumer can be core. Like, uh, it's yeah, just the, the definition of the word. It's, like, yeah, subjective. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, even the people that are in the Brighton parking lot at 7 a.m. cracking fucking tall boys <laughs> yeah, every core. weekend, that yeah. is, like, as real as it gets, you know? Like, you're paying for a pass, you're just stoked to be up there, and you're immersing yourself in this mountain culture that's yeah it's really amazing i don't know like i got i got an even another perspective shift on core too because if you watch the top competitive snowboarders if you're dropping in and you're doing a fucking 20 foot mctwist i'm sorry there's not that's fucking core that's fucking badass like even contest snowboarding depending on your perspective if you're like look at kaishu Doing a backside, oh, yeah. a twenty-four foot backside air at X Games in the half pipe or whatever. I don't know the actual height. Don't quote me on that. But that's fucking core. And then dropping in and slashing the pipe, you yeah. know. And hundred percent. It, it's it's everywhere you look. So you reminded me of something there, Chris. When it, core, like what 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 did what uh, core is a shortened version of hardcore. That's what. In, in our culture and industry, that's core is the hardcore. So the hardcore snowboarder is somebody who's hardcore. Whether it's hardcore, it's 7 a.m. in the Brighton parking lot, popping 
Tali, <laughs> yeah. or it's Kaiju going 17,000 feet out of a 22-foot half pipe at 150 miles per hour. Those are both ha- acts of hardcoreness to me, right? Yeah, just in, I think it's just very similar. Obviously, those are two completely opposite things, the, the Tali in the Brighton parking lot and the Kaiju massive air, but I think the inspo is just the fact that we want to be surrounded and strapped to this piece of wood. And yeah. I think if you really truly care about snowboarding, your your core, I guess, because you if if your life revolves around this thing, I don't know. Really? Obviously some people get paid a lot of money to do it, some people don't. And everyone has their opinion and take on it. But yeah, I don't know. It's it is like Blake is saying, more of a marketing thing yeah. at this point, I guess, core snowboarding. Core is core is just equal to passion, personal passion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is a great perspective shift. And even to take another step too, it's like the split border that's getting up at six and just bagging laps For on sure. some low angle terrain, but loving it, that's doing hardcore. some wiggles. That's core. Yeah. He's got hardcore passion. The lifty? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. No one's more core than a lifty. Yeah. Nope. The yeah. park builders in the snow cat putting in hours and hours of work. That's core. Ski patrol. Ski, Ski patrol, that's core. core. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's amazing. All right. Glad we glad we figured that out. We got that dialed. So yeah. now everybody can stop. We've we've come to the to the end of the internet on core. <laughs> okay, we have a we have another core question. Uh, this one's from Parker Zumowski. Sam, do you have bronchitis? <laughs> no, Parker, I do not have bronchitis. <laughs> but uh yeah, we had a nice little sickness going around on our trip uh, in Japan. There was kind of no shaking it. Parker, you uh, you lit this one up for everyone. Uh, <laughs> thanks, bro. Is he patient zero? Yeah, Parker's yeah. always patient zero. Yeah. <laughs> PZ. I mean, who knows, though? Like, it could have been me. Maybe I'm just asymptomatic. I'm kind of a garbage disposal, so, mm-hmm. yeah. Iron gut. Uh, speaking of uh, Parker Zoom, Good segue to maybe talk Rider of the Year picks. You guys got Rider of the Year picks? Men and women? Parker Zimowski. Yeah, Parker hands down, biased or not, you can't yeah. argue against it, I think. If anybody else is in the running, it's Travis. Travis is obviously a beast. Everyone knows that. It's time for Parker. You know, if you're judging yeah. purely on exposure, Parker, two video parts. Four covers. Standout tricks. Yeah, four covers. Four covers. Interview. Signature product, all, all terrain vehicle. Yeah, yeah, snowboarding in all environments. I think Good that point. to me is huge. Yeah. Like the fact that, like, and both of you two, like, can snowboard everywhere, and that's what it used to be, right? Like, I had to race, bro. Like, I had to wear hard boots, dude, until I, I turned pro. You know what bugs me? I guess a little bit of a shift here, or, but I think border cross should be at the X Games instead of the Rail Jam. <laughs> I, like my take. I, I like, like my take is like dude border cross is this shit it's a race it's so digestible for everyone anyways i'm yeah. kind of diverting here but mount baker banked border cross is yeah that so, that course up so a sketchy yeah. yeah um but yeah anyways That's imagine good. like in you know whatever they invite make sure like some of the bx fucking legends are there but then also maybe like scott blum gets an invite I was just uh, gonna may- say. maybe like you know some some pit bulls once you get, get an invite i would love yeah. i would love to get a part of that you know Chunky be peanut sick. butter mm-hmm. yeah. but uh <laughs> yeah parker zimaski rider of the year um female zoe zoe Sinnott. that's a easy vote for me as well yeah, she's dominant. Jill, yep. Jill's video part yep. was amazing. Jill's crushing. Kennedy yeah. and Emma. Emma. Yeah. There's a lot of rippers, and then like Hannah over in Europe, and and but it's just it's hard. It's hard with Zoe. Zoe's the, dominating right the, now. The front yeah. ten, the Whistler front ten, kind of like solidified all all my we, thoughts. We got to give a couple honorable mentions in this Rider of the Year talk because we don't mention European riders enough. But obviously, Sebe de Buck did his own project. Back ten, Chad's gap. Yeah. Back, uh, no grab back five, bunch of insane jump clips throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that he'll get it, but he should definitely be considered. I think last year, as a whole, video wise, for, as far as like the landscape of like video projects, there was so much amazing shit last year. It's like 
pretty pretty hard to like yeah track it all back and think about like what the best shit is it's kind of hard to make those yeah. calls i'd like to see a jed anderson jump and half pipe if yeah. he were to, to put all that in there i think he'd be because he's got it dude i think it would have yep. been it jed would have really made it pretty like it would have been tough to not pick him had he had more jumps had he, like you said, imagine him launching a giant front nine in the pipe or something like backside alley oop mixed in with the rails, mixed in with the, you know, he can he can do all the jump tricks, he can do everything. So I do agree that that Jed, uh, this was so rail heavy, it, it's hard to pick him for rider of the year. Yeah. And then with Travis, you know, he did win natural selection, he did film an insane video part, he did one of the best lines of all time that he does that. Uh, back rodeo natty and then cab three is a step down and then cab nine like probably arguably one of the best three pieces of natural terrain riding ever done yeah or just any riding yeah. that's i mean because you gotta yeah you gotta like you, it it it's heavy it's like consequence wise right like if he's tommying on that cab like he's probably gonna top it's over yeah <laughs> and he's riding a board with like no tail like nothing is like it's like a totally directional board and he's riding the whole line switch which is crazy i love how spontaneous travis like his riding to me often just seems very like off the cuff he's just like oh yeah all right we're going cab yeah. like i'm on the lip i'm going cab now yeah not like okay so i'm gonna do it here here like i, I don't know it's just fun to watch they got to bring back the top 10 you know it's oh like, top 10 riders yeah here? just something like I like the variety. Like, I like that Jed specializes in what he does, and he dives all into that, and he makes that. And, like, well, I'll rewatch that part for, for a while or whatever, and that's just, like, we know he's the king of that. We know Forrest and Tommy's movie were, were insane. Like, Spen it was sick when Spencer got right of the year off the rail part. Like, it's tough to be, like, you don't want to give out participation awards, but you got, like, Jared, Nick, like, Torgear went insane last year. Like, it's just, like, how do we, like, just kind of give – some sort of top 10 with the main main winner or something like i feel like the mag's got to get that together like bring back the exposure meter bring back the top 10 like let's just start giving more stuff out like it only helps the industry it only helps the athletes yeah, like then you got that yeah. in your contract oh i got rider number six of the yeah year. Like, i got rider number 10 like i mean <laughs> in that at some at a certain point there was like gibber of the year yep yeah, yeah. like i don't know I, yeah. I don't know why that wouldn't be a thing now because there's so many people that just ride street spots. It's like that's a contest of its own, just street riding, you know, and then like backcountry as well. Like there's yeah. you just I don't know. It needs to be segmented. It's a very, very tough call to make. That's for sure. Like I, I'm glad that I'm not like the one 100%. at either of these any of these magazines or whatever outlets choosing who's going to be the winner because it's like this year was a really tough one, I think. Yeah. Dude, 100%. We went through, just to sidebar that, like, we're like, all right, the mags got their thing with Ride of the Year. We just want to do Trick of the Year. We're just going to, like, go through all the tricks and try to get a top 10. And, like, dude, it's so, there is so much insane shit that happens every winter from, and it's like, what, back-to-back -back triple corks and a pipe? Are we considering that? No. Or whatever it is. Like, there's so many different aspects of, like, is the first ever trick on a park jump equivalent to uh, this crazy trick in the streets? Or... You know, there's there's so many different aspects of snowboarding depending on what's important to you, you know. But I think it is important to the the Sherpas of our sport to try to keep it being dope, for lack of a better term, you know, in our eyes. But then, you know, we forgot so many insane tricks. Like, you know, did you see that uh, Denver or frontside melon in the spring where he goes like 400 feet and catches that little pocket transition? Oh, yeah, yeah. sniper. We forgot, like, there was so many bangers that we missed, and that was just for trick of the year. So rider of the year... It, it is really tricky for the media outlets to, like, narrow it down with so much insane stuff. All right, let's just rip through a couple Instagram questions here. Uh, first one, this is from Mike Boggs. I'm thinking this is more of a Blake and Sam question. How many bottles of wine drank at Cassatt? Maybe provide some context what Cassatt is. Mm, in total? In total lifetime? I mean, Parker and Nick have definitely put down... I'd say in the hundreds at some point. Probably. <laughs> Big numbers. Yeah. We sold a bunch of lampshade hats, um, and then we kind of, I think we had like 800 bucks, and we were like, oh, yeah, we'll just spend it at Cassad over the next like couple weeks, and we spent that within like the first hour we were there. Um, what is Cassad for the people who don't know? Cassad is a wine bar <clears throat> in Salt Lake, a little bougie, but still, you know, just 
low, low enough for us to kind of sneak our way into. But yeah, we went there the other night. I think we had like six bottles of wine with Reed and Jill and Stan and Dan, whole crew. <clears throat> Classy little establishment. Yeah. Okay, this one's for uh, Stax. It's from Zach Hale. Stax, how do you really feel about the Front 180 butter? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Heavy topic. Uh, front 180 butter. Uh, last year, I chose to talk about it on my Instagram, and wow, did I learn a lot about talking about tricks on Instagram. But either way... Uh, so it yeah, is a trick. I, You're calling it a trick. Yeah. Uh, I What I stated on Instagram is just that yeah, I just think uh, if you got like four of those in your video, maybe you don't. Maybe we don't need four. Maybe you hit a fat cliff and then you do one after the cliff, or you do it on a feature. I think uh, the Friends Side One Hundred and Eighty Butter does really well in featured terrain. Um, when it's just in the flats and it's like the only f- clip, sometimes I feel like that just gets abused. But uh, yeah. It's more after the clip. It's like you land something. You're like, ah, yeah. Don't pin- know if I went big enough. Big enough. So I'm just gonna yeah. toss out this. You know, I'm having fun. You throw your arm up and do a front 180 butter. That's like played. Like, I'm sorry. I love. I mean, Are it's a t- good feeling trick. I've done it on. I've done it. There's old video parts of everybody. So you, doing you'd it. say you have a couple of violations. Yeah, definitely. But Dude, stop there's, doing there's, it. Everybody should stop doing that in the flats after you do a trick. Just stop it. Are we talking about like the Nico Mueller? The thing well, he yeah. coined. Yeah. yeah. He does them on a steep roll and it's like Well, yeah, but I mean, you know. But cliff, pillow, even whatever, a jump, like pat down of some you know, like just any feature, I feel like it always looks amazing. And it is an amazing one to do. It feels great. I totally understand why the clips of Frontside 180 Butter is used in every video. But I will just say, like, sometimes I think that sole thing without anything else with it sometimes gets abused. Gotcha. And that's it. Always. Can I, can I just chime in here for a sec? It seemed like when the Instagram post came out, it was kind of directed at Colonel Kotzenberg a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of the way it was interpreted for him and Germ and, you know, like, it. yeah, just I learned a, a lot of lessons with my Instagram posts, you know, like, because I wasn't calling anyone out in specific. I was just talking general span of the industry and videos and people putting out this trick. And so do you, yeah. do you and Sage have beef? No, no, nope, not at all. Actually have you thought about it though. Cause it would be kind of, it would be oh, good for- him and I, we got into it for sure. Like, and he G checked me like the boss that he is. And I really appreciate him calling me out and being just like, yo, like, we don't need to have any fucking hate towards snowboarding. It's snowboarding. We all interpret it in our own ways, and we do it in our own ways. Like, But I do agree. And then also in the same sense, it's like we all have an opinion about what is legit and what's not, and I wasn't talking about his Instagram clip at all. But, yeah, the timing of everything was just, like, unfortunate. But that's my dog, and thank you for the G-check, Sage. Question. Have you ever heard the famous Tupac quote, Beef sells records, or maybe it's Biggie. I don't remember which one, but you know, snowboarding could use a little bit more beef. Yeah, well, beef also killed both Biggie and Pac. So it's great, great counterpoint, mm-hmm. Russ. Thank you. Yeah, well, not all good things last forever, you know. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think beef is necessary, but I don't know. It's also good to have like your take. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like it's more just like everybody just lower your ego and let's just like talk some shit on each other everybody does some tr- everybody does some tricks too many times everybody's got some nobody's perfect like 100 percent. just and, accept yeah. it and just call out your own weaknesses and who cares like if we're literally snowboarding like it does not matter like yeah like you put a lot of effort into it and it's your whole life like you can dedicate yourself to it but i hope everybody just calls each other out and it's fun like bob plum calls you out first thing on a trip whatever like, every time you yeah. see him Everybody does repeat <laughs> tricks a thousand times, whatever. Like, yeah. we're not rewriting the rules. It's just, it's just fun. Like, let's just have fun with it. It's a great take. All right, Russ, we got a good question. I think this one's kind of geared towards yourself, or you could at least field it. It's from Hot Licorice. Uh, shout out to Hot Licorice. Talk to him on the gram frequently. His name is Hot Licorice because he, uh, they said his golf swing is like Hot Licorice. So, uh, great handle. Legacy riders, why are they important to the culture and current 
brands. Okay. I mean, that's pretty easy for me, I, I believe. Um, it's like my mom told me something once. Um, and it's, she's told me a lot. Of, she was an amazing human. R.I.P. Mom, love you, miss you. Garnetta Winfield going, you know. Um, she said, Russell, we study history so we know what to expect in the future, right? So how I take that is that if you know what happened in the past and the mistakes that people made in the past, you can look at that and not make those mistakes, right? And so... And snowboarding, it's still, it's such a, a, a baby, right, in, in the grand scheme of, like, sports or activities that we, ha- we don't have, like, 70-year-old snowboarders, right? So the sport, like, everybody for a minute there was like, oh, 14-year-old boys, that's what snowboarding is. It's like, no, it's not. Like, that might have been... You know, in the 90s, what it was, but now those 14-year-old boys are 50, right? And they're 50-year-olds with money that want to buy stuff, you know? So from my side, like, I can help these two out a little bit about, you know, some of the stuff I've gone through in my career and be like, eh, I don't know if you want to do that. This is why I say that, because I've gone through this and I've seen that, right? I, I, I didn't have that. So, like, all my mistakes, which I take full responsibility for, were were just because I was just, like, some punk rock kid and was just like, woo, let's fucking go, right? I didn't have anybody being like, well, Russell, you know, this one, you should maybe probably look at it this way, right? Or that's that's a great idea, like, run with that, right? So I think, you know, and even in in cultures before— they're, they're, they were writing, they were like the elder. The elders would teach the younger people so that their culture could grow and their community could grow positively. They knew how to, you know, like there wasn't a book for, for a native on how to like to survive. Like their parents, their elders had to teach them that. And that's kind of what I, I believe, you know, part of why you need the, the you know, legacy riders, right? Because we, we can help these, the younger people and we also speak to a different audience, right? Like most 55 year old dudes don't want to snowboard with like a bunch of skulls and you know what I'm saying? Like, or some, you know, Y2K graphic. They want something a bit little different, right? They want, they ride a different style of snowboard, right? So, I mean, I think everybody needs to be like back to the wakeboards and everything. Everybody needs to be included, in this, right? Like you don't hit a certain age and you're clipped or you don't look right a certain way and you're clipped. Like that's beat. That's out, bro. I have a question. First of all, just want to say very eloquent answer, beautifully answered. Love everything you said. But when you were 21 and there was an old guy on the team, did you ever have the mentality like, oh, that guy's just taking up a spot? No. I didn't. Okay. Because I hear that rhetoric quite a bit. The difference is we get our ass kicked. You can't kick nobody's ass no more. And I'm not saying that, that it was, it's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying that, like, we were feared <laughs> into respecting these people, right? Like, if you went up to Baker in the early 90s and you were out of pocket, you were getting checked. Like, you were, you were getting checked. And so we did some stupid stuff, but there was stuff you just didn't really, yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's stuff you're just like, eh. I don't want, you know. I don't need text coming down and or Fulton or Farmer or Parada coming down and throttling me. Farmer, um, you know, I pushed it to the limit with Farmer. One time I had to dive into the club because he was coming after me and he ripped the whole back of my shirt off. Yeah. And I was like, well, I probably shouldn't do that one again. So, you know. Beautiful. Now, you're a legacy rider for Ride. You've been an athlete for him forever. How do you feel about the newest addition, Blake Paul, on the team? I think it's amazing. I think... Um, that ride has the street snowboarding side on lockdown, right? And I think we need to, at this point, we need to grow the brand, right? And uh, I think having Blake, which is another at facet of snowboarding, which is, you know, big bigger mountain, backcountry, different style of riding. Not that the riders on ride can't do that because they all can and they're all very good at it, but Blake specializes in that. Like, they specialize in the street stuff. 
So I think it's just great. You know, it's a growing brand, right? Like we're trying to grow. We don't want to stay the same size. We want to get bigger. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good, positive thing. Positive growth is amazing. Like that's, that's what it's all about. Like if you stay the same, you stay stagnant, and then you get grumpy, and then you start going downhill. So positive growth. I'm super hyped. I'm Blake. Thanks, Russ. For it's sure, an honor man. to have your blessing. Oh, For God, real. bro. From the mm-hmm. first time I heard about it, like a <laughs> oh, long, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a for sure. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, uh, sure, this man. is another good segue into a question from uh, Instagram question from go at go snowboard. Now they write Blake's Instagram goes. Can Blake explain how he approached being a modern day pro snowboarder and checking all the boxes? Has social media helped pay off in your career and opportunity wise? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at social. I think like every rider has a different relationship with it. And if you feel forced to post on it, it's not going to, that's not going to do you any good. You don't want to feel like you're forced to have to do something and you don't want to do it. Um, I think luckily, like I've just been drawn to snowboard videos. I've been drawn to the other side of it, taking video class in high school and all that and making my own snowboard videos when I was younger with a group of friends. It's kind of like, I look at Instagram as like an evolution of that. Like here's an outlet where I can be creative. I have full control over it. I can put out whatever I want. I can make any type of edit I want and that we can have like fun with it. It doesn't need to be like unauthentic, like content. Like you can do the job and tag the sponsors and you should be because they're the ones that are like providing you the opportunity to live your life and follow your career. And like, if this is the platform that you need to give back on, then like do the job to do that. Not to say that, Instagram should be the driving force of snowboarding. It's just an outlet and it's a great way if you're going up on hill and you're like, oh, I need a little motivation today to, you know, chuck off something like let's like let's make a Instagram video, let's get a clip, whatever. And it's honestly like a great tool to see what's going on and it's just your own personal relationship with it. You can look at it too much. It can make you depressed. You can completely write it off, not use it at all. It's just like it's just like anything like just define your use of it and where you want to take it. But just like, don't look at it negatively. If like you have to do it, just like put your own spin on it, like have fun with it. Um, it's important in the end, but it's also not important. So put your important posts up and have fun and do that, but also have fun with it and post what you want to post. Amazing. Great take. Yep. Sneaks, you got anything to add? I agree. <clears throat> you just, like feeling forced to do it is always the wrong time. Um, I feel like my most in any post that I imagine same with Blake that does well, I'm not ever thinking about, you know, like, so I don't know, just being able to like harness yourself and also please your sponsors and, you know, tip, tip your hat to them because they're, they're definitely doing a lot for us to be here and have the, the way of life that we do and we're just so spoiled to be here doing this and the fact that like posting on instagram is like a huge part of this puzzle is actually insane like that's making it's just making it easier and better for everyone but on the other hand too it's just tough because you know you want to save footage and you want to put out a video part or or do your own thing outside of just social but you know, I think I think it's like a little bit of a double-edged sword, but I do think it's positive just as far as like growing your own personal brand. And yeah, I don't know, Blake does it so well. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, uh, but you guys today it it allows for some you know like back in the day. I keep going back to do it, run it up. The day. But there were like two videos and two magazines for all of the snowboarders like the pros and the the kids trying to come up. So if you aren't in with either of those outlets, you're and or or you had contests, right? So if you didn't have any of those, you you weren't making it, right? So now like you can crush like Blake does and you just get on the you post your stuff on the gram and then that's it's such a powerful outlet, right? that everybody gets, everybody can use it. I mean, 
do some people ask for too much? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not asked to do that much, right? Like, I don't, I don't have to wake up at 6 in the morning and go dig a, dig a ditch in the rain, you know? I've done that for work, and it's, it sucks. Like, so if you're telling me I have to post twice a month, and you're going to pay me to go and pay for my lift tickets and all my stuff, yeah, I'm going to go do that. Yeah, it, it's a, that's a, such an insane take, too, thinking about also, like, conventional sports. You know, you compare yourself to an NBA athlete or a motocross racer, and, like, so many of these other sports are just, like, results-based. Like, how did you do in the game? How did you do in the race? How did you do... And in snowboarding, there is that for competitive snowboarders. But if your job to get paid to snowboard, you know, is to post on Instagram, fuck, I'll take that over strapping at the top of a goddamn contest run next to these animals doing 1650s or whatever the fuck it's called. 21 something, right? (laughs) 21 savages. And and you might not even podium doing that fucked up run. Like, people like Rene and... Sage people who went out of their way at these contests to like fucking push the envelope in a different direction that maybe haven't been as rewarded as they should have or they have been. You know, it's like no matter how you look at it, it's crazy. Social media, not social media, like amazing run according to the judges, amazing run according to the people watching. Like it's all like your own personal take and like I don't know, it's just wild wild to just see like I don't know. Instagram has made people's careers. Yeah, oh, we yeah. should probably celebrate that. You know, like I'm all for. I'm it. fucking backing anyone who's making it, making it all go down on social media. Like that is insane. I think like for the kids though. Sorry, to, but uh, no, you're good. I think it's like you got to make sure that like you have a take on reality and what's actually important for your own like mental health and what is like you should be doing for your life. And like Instagram is great, but it's not reality. And you need to, like, understand that what you're seeing and who you're looking up to on that, like, that's just a projection of, like, what they're putting out there. And everybody's only going to put them best, like, their best selves on there. So, like, if you're thinking, like, oh, I could never do that or ever, I could never be there or that's just some, like, far off, like, drawn away lifestyle, like, it's probably not as glamorous as it looks. And so you can't, you, you can't just, like, for anyone who's younger that's, like, looking at Instagram and maybe becoming, like, depressed by it or whatever, like, like you got to understand, like, Instagram is a form of, like, art. It's, like, a form of, like, how you can project, like, our careers, at least snowboarding-wise. And, like, people are going to put their photos where they look the best and their selfies and all that. And it's just, it's, like, toxic. It's very toxic place. So you have to, like, you have the good with the bad, you know? And you have to be aware of that and understand that, who you're following, like, they also are going to struggle with the same things that you struggle with. And not, it's not just glamour all the time, you know? So it's like, it's, just, it's like a fake world, and you need to be sure that you're aware of, like, what's really going on and also doing things for the right reasons, like going snowboarding and not posting on Instagram or going to hang out with your friends and not getting, like, fit pics and, like, whatever it is, you know? Like, just, like... It's just, it's an altered reality. And I think if you're like having kids right now or whatever, like that's something I'd be super scared of is like entering into that toxic world. So it's important. We post on it to make ourselves look good. We make the brands look good and they are amazing and everything's great, but it's not real life too. And I also just wanted to just say like being supported to film video parts or not be a contest snowboarder I think is like we we are much more spoiled I would say like oh, like yeah. the fact that we're being supported to just be ourselves authentically and yeah maybe like I don't know for myself personally like my brands like wow I tip my hat to them you know because they, they allow me to be me and there's not this crazy pressure in one direction or the other and so for us to be able to just go out and film video parts and go on these trips around the world to just be us is like the most unique opportunity in the entire world. And yeah, I don't know, like it's not results based. It's not Instagram based. It's, it's just like support in like a unconditional like way that, yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense sometimes. Yeah. It's a piece of the puzzle. Like you said, like yeah. video parts for us are the most important thing and they always yeah. should be. And that's what legitimizes the sport. And that's what keeps it like 
wholeheartedly like legit yeah. and instagram there's a lot of you know there's a lot of weeds to get through yeah i think yeah. uh you two both do this really well is uh you show up right like you can't just be that instagram snowboarder who doesn't ever you, nobody's ever seen him or her right you need to pull up to places whether it's you know tyrell or uh whatever, one of the Midwest mountains or Woodward or, like, I always see Sam at all, like, the, the Slush Mag events, like, the quarter, like, all of them. Just pull up to the community events and be part of the community, right? 100%, and I, I think it's just, like, so vital for the industry to have yes. these communal events like like that Slush is putting on. Um, World Quarters is amazing. Hole. And the bomb hole. Bomb Hole Cup's great, you know, like just bringing everyone together so we all feel like we're working towards the same goal is amazing. Um, and yeah, I'd really just tip my hat to any of those dudes that are chucking ass at the contest because <sighs> it like, it makes no sense to me. I don't know how you can perform at a level like that and they do it so well and we have Instagram snowboarders that do it so well and then we have people that film video parts and then we have people, you know, like it's just like this, so many moving parts and there's no one way that's better than the other. I think there's just, like, bits and pieces you can take from each, and, and it's just cool to see, like, just how, how you can, like, build your own. Okay, let's talk CB Days. Now, CB Days is a wellness company crafting recovery products for athletes made with CBD, a compound from the hemp plant known for reducing inflammation. It was founded by snowboarders DCP and Frank Bourgeois in March of 2020. They developed a unique anti-inflammatory tropical called the OG Muscle Gel. This unique blend of 24 essential oils is designed to be fast absorbed by the skin and deliver the relief from CBD within minutes. This gel has built a reputation for speeding up your recovery time. The best feedback comes from post-surgery trauma, ligaments, muscular inflammation, and arthritis. Now, CBD's products are endorsed and used daily by many legends and upcoming riders like Kurt Wastel, Bjorn Linus, Pat Fava, Ryan Paul, and many more. And even myself, too. I love it. Their mission is to help the snowboard community getting after it by offering 100% natural and effective recovery solutions. You can find CB Days at your local shops such as Wave Rave, Dark Side, Underground Snowboards, Snowshed New York, and other premium retailers who care about your health. If you have lingering injuries right now and love to try CB Days product, you can hop on cbdays.com and score a 30% discount by using code BOMBHOLE30 and start addressing your pain right now. Just head on over to cbdays.com and enter promo code BOMBHOLE30 to put your hands on the famous OG muscle gel, tinctures, and other awesome CBD recovery products. All right, we are introducing the GoPro line of the winter contest. Now, they got $120,000 in cash prizes for ski and snowboard POV clips and the opportunity to be crowned GoPro line of the winter. Now, to enter, upload your raw footage from any GoPro camera to the GoPro line of the winter challenge at gopro.com slash awards and post your line with the hashtag GoPro line of the winter. Now, what's up for grabs? We got 10 grand each for four ski and four snowboard clips from January through April. And then they got 20 grand each for one skier and one snowboarder whose run is crowned GoPro Line of the Winter in May. Each month, GoPro athletes Jamie Anderson, Sage Kosberg, Tom Wallace, and more will judge and select their favorite clips to take home the cash. Submissions will be judged on athletic performance, video capture quality, and overall wow factor. So get out there, record some A-grade lines, and you could be the GoPro line of the winter winner. Great stuff. Great great uh, rant about social. Uh, before, we're going to get into X Games. We had a lot of questions about X Games. Before we do... I uh, just want to add one more thing too. You know, I, I think it's important to realize and be conscious of the fact that the internet is not a real place. You know, talking about like that, like you might have ten thousand followers, or fifty, or a hundred, or two hundred, or five thousand, and you care so much about these followers, but you may, you may never meet these people. You don't know 
them. They're not there for you when you're sick. They're not there for you in the hospital when you break your leg. When your car breaks down, you still have your close friends and your close family of that, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 person unit that is your core circle. And that is always going to be the most important. And so it's like, it's, it's easy to neglect the core circle for this weird social media thing, but the relationships aren't real. So I'd always think about that too. It's like, you know, it, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous place sometimes in addition, but you guys all just mm-hmm. talked about that beautifully and we don't need to beat a dead horse. So I'm going to keep moving. Um, and, uh, one, before we get into X games, you guys were talking about community events. Uh, I'm going to do a quick announcement about bomb hole cup while we're on the subject. It is April 6th and 7th. Uh, so day one is a bank solemn, all ability levels. We're doing a beginner class this year. So if, if you're, it's your first year snowboarding, you can race, uh, and you know, it's, it's for beginners. If you can barely make it down the hill, it's not, if you win by a minute, you're disqualified. You know what I mean? So, um, we have skiers on boards. We say skiers are allowed. You just got to ride a snowboard. We have pro class. We have vintage snowboard class. We have all different classes. Last year we had 450 racers, two courses. And then day two is a park showdown. So we have Grom, uh, we have open, which is like competing for product more of, uh, all ability levels. And then we have pro competing for cash. Now, Huge announcement, huge announcement. Now, big conventional sports guy, as you guys know, and any major sporting event, there's one thing that they have in common, whether it's the Super Bowl, whether it's you're watching a hockey game, whether you're watching Supercross, and that's the national anthem, okay? Nothing gets you fired up like the national anthem. (laughs) So, to paint a little picture here, I'm so fucking excited about this, guys, is... Right before, the way we do pro class is we open it up with mandatory 900s. It used to be cab 9. We open it up to any direction 900. So the jump for the first five minutes of pro class, the only thing that is open is the jump, and it's only open to people trying cab or 900s for that matter. So right before we do mandatory 900s, we're going to have somebody sing the national anthem. Right now, plan B, Danny, our shipping guy, has got some pipes on him. But we're looking for an ace. We want somebody that's got, like, really can belt it out. Sage said he'd be down. He's an Olympian. You know, he's sacrificed for our country in some ways. So, uh, yeah. you know, Sage might not be able to make it. But we're looking to find a good singer. So if you guys know, like, hey, my my sister is, like, can nail the national anthem, reach out to us because we want it to be electric. And then I'm also looking into military flyovers. So if you guys, if you guys got any connections in the military, we can get like a, a fighter jet. You know, we can time it with the national anthem. So it goes national anthem, fighter jet, right into the mandatory 900s. That's the kind of environment. We're looking for that energy that's just electric. That's what we love about events. You know? Foxborough? You're looking yeah. for Foxborough, aren't so, you? Yes. <laughs> Bright- Brighton again, correct? Yeah, we're doing it in yeah. Brighton. And then one other thing while we're on this. So last year... We, it's like five minutes. It's only open at 900, but people get in there and they do a 360. And all that does is it fucking sucks the air out of the room, okay? like Breathe, Chris, just, breathe, breathe. Just wait. <laughs> just wait till the 900s are done because everybody's putting on a show. Nobody gives a shit about your 360. So it's like, it's and I'm going to go as far as saying if you jump in the mandatory 900 section this year and you do a 360, you're disqualified from the event. You can keep riding, but you have no chance of winning. Because I just want to be very clear, because there's people in there that are like, I can't do a 900. Well, that's your problem. That's a personal <laughs> problem. That's not our problem. That is your, that is, that is nothing to do with us, the fact that you can't do a 900. I can't do a lot of things, but I'm not going to enter a contest to do something I can't fucking do. So you can still, you can still win. I'm just saying, you can still win the event. Like, let's say you don't do the mandatory cab nine and you beat the rest of the, you know, you just destroy the contest. Great. You can still win. Just don't fuck up the mandatory 900s right after the national anthem. That's all I'm asking for. So that's my rant. Um, I wish you guys who are listening could see how red Grandy's face is right now. <laughs> I is mean, it? Is it red? Your no, you're a little red. You can't be as red as me, dude. I'm well, no. always just red as fuck. So. Maybe it's the you're, lighting you're over here. But you, wow. So. Okay, let's talk X Games, guys. Let's talk X Games. A lot of people want to know about X Games, they want to break down. I think I'll start by running through some results so everybody knows. Quick recap. Uh, we'll start with, we're going to end with men's slope because we have to talk about Renee's run. Uh, let's start with, uh, w- women, let's start with big air. So we got, uh, women's big air, Kokomo. She absolutely destroyed 
Um, just head and shoulders above the competition. She's on a great, great tear right now. Uh, Iwabuchi, great style. Kokomo, great style. Anna Gasser got third. Women's Big Air was electric. I think Mia Brooks, I don't have it in front of me. I think she got fourth. She put on a show. And then for Men's Slope, Taiga Hasegawa. Yee, yee. Yeah, did I say Big Air? Oh, I said Slope. Yeah, what I meant, correction, uh, Big Air, Taiga Hasegawa. Kid's a problem. Yeah. Good Homie, major. Homie's doing 19s in his slope run on the second jump. If like, he had put his slope run down, yeah, he would have podiumed yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and then we got Hiroki got second, and then Mons Roisland, shout out to the kind of a dark horse, got third. Some Love cool, yeah. ac- different axes. Um, and then we can get into Pipe. I mean, Chloe Kim, she did a cab 12, uh, which was insane. She's like, she reminds me of watching Sean White in his prime in like the 2010 era when he was just yeah. like, Sean's going to win. Or Teddy, eh? Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like, she's head and shoulders above. But a lot of the other... Uh, women were injured. Maddie Mastro couldn't ride. Um, so, yeah. And then so Ono got second. And then uh, Mitsuki Ono. And then I actually don't have who got third in front of me. I apologize for that. Uh, men's pipe. We got Scotty James, Ruka Hirano, and Kaishu Hirano. Um, you know, let's just talk about that. Kaishu was insane. He put on a show. He did a 22-foot backside air. Did you guys see that? Yeah. yeah. Unreal. It was McTwist grabbing kind of like a melon method. Uh, he made half pipe look good. Scotty's technical skills, unbelievable. Ayumu didn't put down a run, which was unfortunate. If Ayumu had landed, he never really made it past his second hit, but his triple corks were seriously like 20, 20 feet out, you know. Uh, Ayumu and Kaishu own the half pipe. Yeah, they uh, run they, it up. They're kind of the quintessential part of pipe right now. Uh yeah, I tip my hat to those two. They're 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 my favorites. I feel like that backside air, it's just like that wins. The, you know, you have a standout moment like that. He's had it before. He had it at the at the Olympics. I think I read some caption like from Aaron Blatt or something on the gram that was like, when he drops in, every single photographer is running around scrambling for their angle. Like, you know, there's just like that moment that you see the most viral moment, whatever, and that's just like that goes to just like represent snowboarding in an awesome way, like competitively, I feel like. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you know, a, a huge backside air has always won in the media, right? From Chris Roach to Craig Kelly. And then like Ingmar Bachman who had, you know, put extra 10 years on his career from yeah. one air that was so big and so perfect to now this the young kid and, and I think style is everything right like for me personally like I'm just a, I'd rather see something like that a, yeah. bi- a big straighter is hard anywhere it's on a snowboard it's like, it's the hardest thing I feel like you can do because if if you're pulling if you, if you're making that backside air transcend through generations of humans like that's a really hard thing to to emulate. That's that doesn't make sense in my head. You know, like I don't know if it's just one of those things that it's like not easy to do. It's and the nine eleven of snowboarding, yeah. really. Porsche nine eleven, same thing, a little different, but it's really the same body shape. Right? Yeah, I'm almost glad you clarified. I wasn't sure where you're going with the nine eleven <laughs> reference, but uh, going back to yeah, like also another thing with half pipe right now, like it, it's it's in this interesting spot where you have. A lot. Like I was watching X Games, and I'm gonna be honest with you. Locks open, which we did a broadcast for. the The pipe final was probably more electric because you also had Valentino Gaselli who hurt himself in practice, but he was going huge. He was going massive, and he did a front sixteen. But like, he's going just enormous, and it just makes half pipe look exciting, you know. And then you also had Lil Kitaki who was putting down back to back triple corks in practice, never landed his run also going huge but i think there's this like when i was looking at the field of x games like without a lot without caselli and and looky talky it's like a lot of the riders it's like this very technical sport where it's like a lot of switch backside and like big spins but it's not like you 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 don't get a feeling from it when you when you watch kaishu and ayumu 
And dude, I'm going to say Scotty James switch McTwist revert is incredible. Yeah, like those are sick. things that are yeah. saving. I think they're single handedly saving half pipe snowboarding. Like these guys going big with good style and making it look good versus just technical snowboarding. It's like, I'm interested in half pipe again, where for a, probably a five year stint, I didn't give a shit about half pipe. So that was a little rant I had about half pipe, but I think we're in a good spot with it right now. Yeah, it's hard. It's like, where do you go? Like, you know, Anger. on the jumps and the pipe, like, you. I, I mean, it's just like a beat up topic, but it's like, yeah. can they spin more? Yeah, they can. It, it, it's looking like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should they? It's Dude, the question. I, it's not I mean, can they? I mean, yes, they can. They're just, I mean, Red, Red's eighteen looks like a fucking back ten. Yeah, like yeah, it's crazy. like he's coming out of it so chill, looking so composed, like it's actually fucking insane. How many times around is that? Five three sixties. Gee, I think correct. Is that five five three sixties? You're asking the wrong guy. Um, <laughs> I thought you were calculating it. Three seven ten. ten uh, That's where I stop. Fourteen. And then eight. Eighteen. Yep. Yeah, but there's people are doing twenty ones and what's the yeah. highest spin ever done? Twenty one sixty, right? Yeah, we yeah. we uh, was like Ian Mattioli, we started calling him twenty one savage. Uh, yeah, trying to get that to stick. I don't know yeah, if that, he's down or not. That's that's pretty sick. Kind of, I would run that nickname up. Uh, I wanted to comment on Kai Shu's McTwist with a Nellen. Yeah, with like a dude that that is so dope. Uh, he's grabbing outside the binding below the nose. I don't know. It's just a really cool take on a McTwist, I guess. Like, maybe, like, we would call it, like, not a grab, but I think it's legit. That's a grab. No, Do you think that that was a safety grab, maybe? Because he was going so... You know how sometimes you get it? No, because he like, normally grabs Japan. Yeah, I think he's been repping it. It looks oh, so that's good. Some new, okay. Yeah. Dope. I feel like it'd be easier to but go I'll over like, the handlebars and just kind of taco the end of the yeah. pipe on that thing. 100%. Oof. It's scary. Yep. Uh, okay, then let's keep running through. Uh, knuckle Huck, uh, women's Knuckle Huck, Kokomo, another Kokomo was on a tear. Holy shit. Yeah, so she won that. Annika got second. Dope ass D, huge fan. And then Egan went, shout out Egan, got third at Knuckle Huck, served a fatty crail. And then there's a lot of people in the messages that wanted us to talk about men's Knuckle Huck and the results. So there was Liam Brearley won, Zeb Powell second, Darcy Sharp third. Um, you know, they all put on a show as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, the only person who, you know, I don't know, you know, Darcy was on a tear. I thought Luke Winkleman put on a good show as well. But uh, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be a judge. It'd be it'd be a tough, it's a tough pill to swallow. Especially it's, the knuckle huck, right? Because that's the newest one and you don't have like a, a baseline, right? Yeah, yeah like not, maybe not the techn most technical trick should win. And it's, yeah. that's a tough one. Like, yeah, it's a bit more subjective than... Even then pipe or slope or big air because it's like like you're saying it's it's a bit of a new, new platform or whatever. So yeah, dude, and and some people were saying like, is it has it turned into just a small jump competition? And and my answer is no because the takeoff is not it's not like a wedge. Like homie Liam Brearley did do a nollie double back rodeo ten or twelve. And I'm like thinking to myself that is better than anything I've ever done on my snowboard or ever will do ever. I mean, <laughs> it's I, like insane, I know? think it's insane when they show the, uh, I think they're calling it X Games mode now, like the slow-mo clips and homies heads are like probably like this rock star can height off the knuckle, <laughs> you know, like, like, dude, if you hit your head, like you're smoked, nine, nine. Yeah. but like, but then they travel so far off the knuckle that you get like their air awareness is just like very on point. It seems like, because you're like, okay, I'm comfortable with flipping and my head being six inches away from the ground. And then I'll whatever, continue my, my trick off the knuckle. And that's where like the, the hang time comes from. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Cause you yeah. can't drag your hand on a, on a jump, on a standard issue jump. No. Nope. Right. So, so in some ways it is pretty, pretty fucking risky to just like, yeah. Hawk yourself off a knuckle, you know? Like it's also amazing, like all of us just being piles of shit on the couch judging like this thing's and if we were to go like drop in, go mock three hundred at this thing, 
and be it's it's gnarly. Like it's never as gnarly as it looks on TV. But it, I guarantee if a civilian went and were like, wow, the speed that they're taking at that knuckle is gnarly and just dropping out of the sky. How and many? It's like at sorry, it's at what? night icy. Like yeah. the whole X Games is always icy. Like you forget about that. Like it's just pure ice. Like <sighs> never it never looks like good conditions. In the words of uh, or your buddy it, Todd Richards, they all had to hockey up. Mm-hmm. Out there. Oh yeah. yeah. Lots okay. of sharp edges. Uh, another reminder: after this uh, segment, we're gonna cut to an interview with Mia Brooks. But let's keep running through results here. Keep it moving. So, uh, and then so we talked to Knuckle Huck. I guess uh, Rail Jam. Uh, Pat Fava won. There you go. And then for women, I think Grace Warner won. I really just saw the recap. I didn't watch it live. Do you guys have any takes on the Rail Jam? Did you guys see it? Yeah, I have some takes. Uh, it was insane. Uh, Fava's consistency was like undenied. Um, my one take would be maybe it'd be nice if X Games would invite some people who like devote their entire careers to riding street. Maybe not just pulling people from slope or big air to do it. That's my, you know, one request to X Games maybe. Like, because I think there's a lot of jibbers out there who should have been there that weren't. Um, but yeah, it was amazing. Uh, I, couldn't imagine riding a s- icy ass rail contest. It sounds Scary. like a nightmare to me, but they put it up and like Luke was busting, Darcy was busting. Uh, yeah, everyone kind of just went off and hailstorm. Yeah, Zach did actually really good. I was I was enjoying watching Zach. Yeah, nice. I have a question. Did you guys, uh, since especially you, Sam, you be out there in them streets? I saw some comments and some memes about how small the features were. Yeah, it looked like cluttered. The yeah. cor- I feel like the course could use some work. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I'm I, not, I, like, particular whatever I on think that, uh, if they're going to do another contest like that, it should be not on the resort. It should be, like, remember the Hard Rock in Vegas? I yeah. remember it's, like, stuck in my fucking head. Like, the OG Vans Cup Rail Jams and the OG Hard Rock contest were insane because it was, like, a fucking 20-stair down rail a giant hub a ledge and like a kink rail and they're all just like it's just like one setup and it's like your kind of standard features but like it's simple and it's way more justified not like some like i don't know packing a bunch of fucking park rails into like one little knuckle um but yeah i don't know i just remember like og rail contests seeming way more glorified like lucas magoon was going off for years they yeah. need some like fire in there, something you know, like a yeah. fire pit, big old wall <laughs> ride, like I don't yeah, know, something. No, it like, like super the slope cross. course like, rails, but yep. smaller on a knuckle. Yeah, big, big wall ride, big down rail, kink, Sharp kink pit. hub a ledge, like, but make it big, like, and we don't need like thirteen little transfer options on like flat down rails and flat bars and down rails. Cool. You know what I think would also help in a situation like that? Granted, it's not scaffolding like you talk about hard rock, but like a rope toe. So everybody's just like, boom, right to the top, right to the top, right to the top. And you're, you're cycling like, like you, maybe it's a final. Maybe there's a qualifier, so you boil it down to the best of the best. And then the final is rope toe laps high. You know, yeah. everybody's getting a piece because I think that, that you're going to get better tricks when the riders are warm and they're just right back to the top. Um, yeah, like, like basically X Games rail like X Games Street exhibition, whatever, it should be on, like, the Red Ledge in Quebec. Yeah, that'd be sick. Like, like it should be on a fucked-up street spot that, like, is really, or, you know, like, kind of like the Red Bull Heavy Metal right now. You know, so, something along those lines. But, yeah, I don't know, just, like, emulating, like, a legit big... Find, find something in Aspen that's gnarly. I, I bet there's probably... There's spots, gotta be. But. Another thing, too, to note, I guess it was a test event, so they're, this is their first year. They didn't do first, second, and third. They just did first, but I imagine they'll probably do it bigger and better next year. We can hope. Yeah, I'm sure they will. So, um, cool. Covered that, and then uh, let's get into slope style. So, we'll start with men's, and we'll end with women's because we got the interview with Mia. So, starting uh, Red, put it down. I mean, he could have won with, I think, all three of his runs pretty much. Judge, judges need to start thinking about what they're, like, happened to Ayuma at the, Olymp- at the Olympics, and now it happened to Red X Games, where these people have to, like, I don't know, show the judges that they can do their same run more than once. 
to get rewarded. It's kind of kind of wild to me, I guess. Like I, I just couldn't imagine being in in the judges' shoes and or Red or Ayumu or any of these people competing shoes because like it's just so subjective and the fact that they're good enough to like push and do that psycho run and then have the mental toughness to do it again and then hopefully get scored a little bit better is insane. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, yeah, Mark Mick even said when he landed his second run, you know, he's like, wow, the judges were very generous, you know, and things like that. And I don't think he expected to get the score. But I'll say this, Mark Mick, I counted him out. Like, I, I kind of was like, is Mark Mick getting too old? He hasn't been doing the other contests this year. You know, does he still have it? And it was really cool for Mark to show up and just put a heater of a rundown. Yeah. Uh, obviously, lifelong kind of like we've watched, we've watched Mark compete for a decade now and dominate. So it's always fun to see our heroes keep killing it. Yeah, it was cool. Like he was posting some Instagrams up in like Ruka, Finland early this year. It's sick. Like, I don't know. Cause the, the sun goes down so early in the fall up there or whatever, like just like training on a jump at nighttime, like chucking is crazy to me. And yeah, I think he's Ma- just like been through it. He's yeah. done it all. Like as he three Olympics, I think he's done three Olympics, podium that every one of them. It's like been in the game. Doesn't have to do it still. No. Like is old enough to do whatever he wants or is far enough in his career way further. Like he could have stopped whenever. And he's just, he's a competitor. He's he like, loves it. he loves it. He eats it up. Before he was there, he was like in like Canada filming on a sled trip. And then he just goes there, shows that he's still got it. Like, Hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. That's core. That's core. Give it up. That's like, core. That's core. Yeah. He uh, won last year, like. And also, yeah. Blake, you guys spent some time in the summer getting shacked in SoCal, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Who's been, who's nicer on the surfboard? You got him covered, or? Uh, he's got he he did a little air in a wave pool one uh, one year that was pretty insane. I don't know. We're we're both similar. We both like can get around a wave, but you go surf with like some of the people down there, and we're both just like we suck. Like, but it feels like we're good. <laughs> Okay, then moving on to third place, Mons Roisland. Love seeing Mons uh, two podiums at X. He was doing some really cool off-axis like Todios and bringing his own flavor, and we're big Mons fans, um, so stoked on him. The one thing that we got to talk about, I think everybody had a similar feeling, is that Rene put down this insane run, run mm-hmm. one of three, and basically did this, you know, nailed everything top to bottom. You might be able to argue the switch double back rodeo, is a little bit sketchy, but you know, on the on the last jump, he did this kind of fakey cab ten tail grab, and then reverted it back to nine, and it was just like new and progressive, and he's attacking the course. And you know, I know that like judging, there's criteria, and judging is difficult, and I don't want to throw shade at judges, but for me personally, with none of the judging criteria in front of me, it was it was one of my favorite runs. It was so fucking exciting, and I feel like he might have got snubbed, at least in my heart. Uh, you guys have any takes on that run? Uh, yeah, one thousand percent. I agree. Also, his rail section was crazy. He did like a backside two seventy hand drag over the rainbow switch. rail to switch. No, he switched back. Oh yeah, switch switch back to to normal. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just think it's one of those things where, like, I guess if the judges reward that, then everyone else. You know, it's like it's like a weird thing. I think the judges are probably in a weird stalemate because they're like. Okay, if we reward this, then like, what's the sixteen or the eighteen, like the regular sixteen or eighteen, compared to this fakie trick that we've never seen anyone do? Mm-hmm. Um, like, how how do you go about that? Um, you know, like it's just one of those like weird things where it's like, homie is at least, dude, to go to X Games and like try a run out of the norm like that and put it down and not get rewarded well and still have a fucking huge smile on your face. That's like. Fuck the podium. Like, you you just did it, bro. Like, yep. and if they ain't going to reward you, that's their fault, you know? Like, because you're actually, like, taking that style element and that creativity element that they always talk about but never reward. Yeah. And, like, taking that in your own way. Like, dude, that's what Sage did at the Olympics. And I think a lot of people, I don't know, like, there's a million things that it's all subjective, you know? But, like, Sage at the Olympics when he won, like, undoubtedly had, like, the most unique run. Yeah, the difference. With, like, it was just unique. It was. It was, what, was it the hardest thing in the entire world? I don't know. But, like, 
Sage actually fucking pushed the envelope in that direction and they rewarded him for it on that day and he deserved it. Yeah. Just like they should do for other people like Rene. Yeah. Because everyone else for the most part is like kind of on the same tip. I think. Like doing the same sort of tricks, spinning, like everyone's got a, you got a 10, a 16, an 18. Like, but Rene's going like fakey and he's hand dragging and like whatever this, that, the other thing. It's like, I don't know. I think, it, and I'm glad you brought up the Sage thing. I talked with Chris a little bit about this. And I am all the way down for the creativity. Yeah. But you got to realize that when you're doing something new that's unexpected, it has to be flawless or else everything you've done just gets, like, watered to them, right? Yeah. It, it, you can't have a hand drag. You can't – you got to do it like that. Sage did that run, pr- if I remember correctly. It's pretty flawless. Flawless. Yeah. And so it was like there was never – like it was just uptick the whole time. Yeah. There was never any downtick, right? Yeah. So I think just – and any of you contest kids out there, if you're watching, do that stuff. But realize that if you do it, it's got to be flawless. Yeah. And then, you, then they should – and then if they don't give it to you, then there's a problem. But if you hand drag and maybe open up like a quarter of a second too early, they're going to dock you because it's easier for them to dock you than it is to reward you, right? Yeah. Because if they, they don't really know what they're looking at and it's like, oh, you gave me a reason to not score you well. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and even to add to that too, with Rene, like the, the, the fakey – 1080 rewind that he did you fucking have to open up you're you're bringing a 1080 back to a 900 it's like okay. and so i think that like what, what we all we always beat our heads and talk about dude we're so sick of 21s and this and that and then here comes our guy Rene, who's flying the flag of just doing him and keeping it fun and creative and then it's not rewarded so it, i feel like there's like a place for those people like i remember watching x games when i was younger and like identifying almost with the people that weren't doing well that I was, like, psyched yeah. on. Yeah. Like, you're like, oh, like, this Aldo. guy looks cool. And, like, was like that. maybe they didn't put a run together, but, like, at least, like, I think people can, like, he's bringing something to the table. Like, every contest has that person where you're like, oh, like, it would have been sick if they, like, could do this. But, like, technically, mathematically, with the spins and the amount of what's going on, like, it, it maybe doesn't work for the podium, but at least, like... Hopefully there's kids when for sure there is looking up to him and saying like, oh, like I could do something different or whatever. I, yeah. I like can identify with what he's doing versus just like the like yeah. constant. All right. Let's talk about Blackstrap. Now I've been testing some of their products lately. They sent some stuff to the bomb hole. And let me tell you, they make some high performance base layers, beanies, balaclavas and more. Recently tried out the Blackstrap Summit base layers on a full day hiking around the backcountry. We were getting sweaty, it was cold, and I was really impressed. They're breathable, they're stretchy, they're quick drying. Good base layers are key for staying warm and comfortable in the mountains. And they are worth investing in. I wear base layers every time I go ride, so great base layers are absolutely crucial, and Blackstrap makes some really high-quality ones. So check them out. Also, I was impressed with their balaclavas. As you know, I wear a helmet these days, new to that game. And I love the fit under the helmet. So if you're looking for a great under the helmet balaclava, be sure to check out bsbrand.com. And you can use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order. Again, that's bsbrand.com, promo code BOMBHOLE, 20% off your order. They also recently came on board to support BOMBHOLE Cup, as well as our Woodward Dust Bomb Ride Day. So support brands that support snowboarding and check out bsbrand.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order and get yourself looking fresh out there on the hill. All right, let's talk hydration. Let's talk Element. Now, please give a warm welcome to the new Element Chocolate Medley, a tasty trio of flavors including chocolate mint, chocolate chai, and chocolate raspberry, designed to be enjoyed hot or swirled into your favorite recipes. Now, winter hydration matters too. We become less thirsty in both cold weather and high elevations, but that doesn't mean we're hydrated. Optimal hydration requires the right fluid to electrolyte balance to keep us feeling and performing our best. Go to drinkelement.com. That's drinklmnt.com slash bombhole 
for a free gift with purchase. I don't, you know, you got a little 10% rule for sure. You definitely got to go 10% rule with your homies. Oh, yeah. um, but Runky had the day of days. And then the Chiefs won that same, like, seriously, like 30 minutes after Slope style. He goes <laughs> goes to the bar, watches the Chiefs win, and make their way back to the Super Bowl. So I think it was probably one of those uh, day of days for him. Yeah, I can actually confirm. I had a conversation with Runky the following Monday. Uh, that was Sunday. I talked to him on Monday. He sounded horrendous. Like, I'm talking horse voice. <laughs> Um, irritable. Uh, he looked like he definitely had a good night on Sunday. Yeah, that's that's when I like to hit Runky with like the some of those hard hitting questions when you know he's just like down bad in a way. You get him a little stressed out sometimes. He's oh gonna he's gonna listen to shit and be like, "Fuck you, Red. I knew I didn't like you." <laughs> Dude, I can actually I can attest to that because I called him because I was so excited that we're doing a national anthem this year at Bombhole Cup, and I, it was not important at all. I just was excited about the national anthem. He's like, "I got I got right, I got five thousand emails right now. I got five thousand emails right now. What you're saying is just, it's not important to what we're doing right now. Okay, so can I just call you back tomorrow?" You're like, <laughs> He's got he's got the hangover of the ages in him on the on a Monday after X Games. What's the what's the prize money for first place? Dude, that's the funny part is like I I don't even know. Like he, we all all of our buddies are talking about that when we like sign up for a contract. You think to be like the first thing in the email is like first, second, third prize money, and every time you do good at a contest, you're like, fuck. I wonder how much money I won if I if I made some money. <laughs> so I don't really know. There, I I mean I know it's gone down from what it is, but I was here in uh, maybe like 25 or something. That's it? Let me tell you something. You know yeah, you're yeah. securing the bag when you don't know how much yeah. money when you win. That's that's like <laughs> the best way of saying it. True story. Another, uh, hey, another conversation we were having earlier, <laughs> another conversation we were having, I'd love to pick your brain on, is, uh, you know, um, Rene Renacongas put down a, a super heater progressive run with that kind of fakey 1080 rewind. Uh, did you have yeah. any, do you have any takes on his run? So unfortunately I, I didn't really watch too much of the contest, but I did watch a little bit of his and then Judd was definitely, uh, Judd was saying that he's like, Oh, I definitely would have had Renee up there. Cause I think he did do that sick run, but apparently, uh, like when I rewatch his run, if I had to guess like where they got him was like the switch double backside rodeo out of the side hit. He just has that like pretty good double hand slap or whatever. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but the thing is with Rene, like anytime Rene's in a contest and he lands a run, damn well he's going to be a fucking threat and should probably be on the podium. You know, like the guy does. I mean, he's like the definition of what we've been talking about in slopes that we're like, so let's start seeing different runs and harder shit where it's like, you know, the cab double pullback or whatever they does on the third jump. You're like, you're not seeing anyone else do that. You know, so it should probably be you know, rewarded as well with the big tricks for sure. Yeah. Well, dude, it was, it was fun to watch all you guys. I actually remember if I think back on locks, I was watching the qualifying runs. He got hosed on his qualifying run. And then I think you did as well. If I remember correctly. Right. Um, I don't know. I think I just snuck into that semifinal or whatever, but dude, the judges this year have been like crazy, crazy harsh on, which is good because I, I think the level's so high with snowboarding, but they've been crazy harsh on in locks. It was not gapping the rails and Rene like gapped the teardrop to the last one. And it's like, it's kind of like, it's pretty funny, but it's like if the judges right now, if you kind of fuck or, you know, gap a rail or do something like that, it's almost like your runs over. Like it's not even, you know, in the books anymore. And it's just harsh judging and, I don't know. Not gnarly sport. No, what's going it's, on right it now? It is crazy too. Think about like, I've been a rail rider my whole life. I never really figured out switchback twos to regular. Very technical trick <laughs> to do it every time in a run, even though it's a gap trick, is fucking insane. And to get docked for something that technical is kind of psycho. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just weird. That was the one in X Games. And Craig McMorris is like, "Are you doing the switchback two pullback?" I'm like, "Dude, I don't think I can do that trick anymore in slope style." Like. <laughs> For my own, for my own good, I do, I've done it too many times. It's not cool anymore. <laughs> I got to get out. I got to get off that wave. Yeah. Well, still, it's heater. It's fun. It was fun watching you rip. Uh, are you done with contests for the year? What What do you got coming up on the docket? Um, I think so. I'm I'm going to. I have that natural selection duel uh, that I'm flying to Crested Butte tomorrow. The next day with Austin Sweeten, which will be um, funish if hopefully the snow's good. 
Um, and then with Mammoth getting canceled, how the point system works, you kind of need like three contest results, whether or not like they're good or not. And uh, having like two slope style contest results versus someone with three is like doesn't really work. So I got to try to fit another slope style somewhere in there. But um, yeah, I don't know. And then, oh, dude, all the boys that were all going to Saudi Arabia for a big air on the, at the end of this month. So wow. You know, you could take some, uh, Sam Taxwood's done some sandboarding. Uh, you, you should, he's, he might be some, the guy you could talk to. He's actually in studio here. Uh, Sam, would you recommend these guys going sandboarding while they're down there? For sure. I would recommend it for anybody. I yeah. mean, it's just kind of like, yeah, I might have to hit you with the FaceTime after this. Yeah, no, for sure. Definitely get on the dunes out there. I imagine they're way bigger in, in Dubai. Is that where you guys are doing the event? Uh, I think so. Yeah, dude, that's going to be nuts. Fucking good luck out there. <laughs> have some fun. You know, I've heard Sam actually yeah. re refer to himself as a bit of a dunatic. He loves the sand dunes so much. <laughs> Who doesn't love the dunes, man? I heard him call himself <laughs> the Jerry Lopez of Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is, that is not true for anyone out there. For anybody listening right now, I would never refer to myself in regards to Jerry Lopez in the slightest, but thank you. <laughs> oh, we're joking. Red, I'm going to text you all these photos we did. Uh, we Photoshopped Sam, Sam sandboarding on, uh, all types of uh, features, past and present. So we'll fire those over for some inspiration. <laughs> for uh, hell yeah, I'm gonna need, we're gonna need all we can get, dude. Red, I just wanted to say the no slide pretzel switch fifty that you did over and over at X Games was actually insane. Oh, thank you, man. I was hyped. I was wondering. Uh, dude, I was wondering because the angle you can't really tell. I was like, oh, dude, I wonder if the angle like, actually crazy. screwed it. But I just kept look. <laughs> I kept watching, and I was like, dude, this is fucking crazy. He's going no slide pretzel switch fifty over and over. Like, yeah, just respect that. That was beast. Oh, thanks a lot, dude. That means a lot. Thank you. Uh, yeah. the, the rail setup. That was like that course was perfect. And so were the rails too, but it was like, they were so tight together. Like when you landed backwards, you're like, holy shit, I'm hopping into a switchboard slide. Yep. So they were, they were tight ones. All right, man. Well, thanks, Red. Great chatting with you. Enjoy the win. Yeah. Enjoy, enjoy the day, boys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, congrats, bud. Yeah. Thanks. Peace. Later. Later. Bye -bye. Red Gerard. He's a national treasure champion. What a gem. All right, let's wrap up talking about X Games because I think we covered it, and then uh, and then we'll get into that call with Mia Brooks, and then later in the show we also have a uh, Todd Richards segment as well. So stay tuned. Uh, but uh, lastly, we have uh, Mia Brooks or sl women's slope style. So Mia Brooks won. She landed all three runs. She killed it on all three runs. She could have won with all three runs. She put on a show, so uh, we'll check in with her after this. Kokomo Marasi absolutely annihilated the course, and also Iwabuchi, another style god. So women's slope is in a great spot right now. It's like one of the funnest events to watch. Yeah, Kokomo had that like leather jacket with some fur, just Whoa. rocking like an open jacket in slope style. Like yeah. all about that. Yeah. <clears throat> OJC. Yeah. You know what the bag. OJC is for people that are unfamiliar? Open oh. jacket crew. That yeah. is it. Yeah. Correct. I'm part of it. I mean, sometimes you just got to let it you know, breathe. You got to let it breathe. That's a fact. Okay, we're going to cut to a quick call with Mia Brooks. We caught in with the gold medalist, the style god. So let's cut to that right now. All right, we got X Games gold medalist Mia Brooks on the line, fresh off of the win. How are you feeling, Mia? Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, life's pretty good right now. Love that. How old are you, Mia? 17. Woo! Good time. Yeah. Good time to be alive. That's amazing. Now I gotta, I gotta ask. You know, coming off yeah. of locks open, you were killing it in practice. Uh, didn't quite put down a run. How were you feeling going into X Games after your locks open experience? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it didn't really go my way in the finals, but it kind of fueled me up for X Games because I knew that if I did all the tricks that I wanted to do, I could win. Um, so yeah, I think even though I didn't do too good at lax, it actually did be pretty good for the future. Now I've seen some photos of you coming out, repping the cowboy hat. Let's talk about the cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, we were driving to Aspen and we stopped to like the sickest cowboy store ever. 
and um, yeah, bought the cowboy hat, rocked up to X Games, and they needed some profile shots. And I was just like, oh, fuck it, we'll do it now. <laughs> we'll just do it in the cowboy hat. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I did. It's funny. <laughs> I love it. You don't see too many cowboys from the UK. Uh, it's a great look. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Now, I got to ask, a lot of people, when it comes to contests, are really buddy-buddy at the top. They're claiming to be best friends with everybody. I kind of heard that you got that dog in you when it comes to contest time where you kind of lock in and uh, aren't necessarily in that headspace. Yeah, I think obviously everyone wants to do their best. But, um, you know, I feel like from coming from me, I kind of like to have a good vibe up there. And if it's kind of like you get the mood that it's not a good vibe, you know, I always try and just sort of say hey to everyone and that sort of, like, not really, but it sort of lightens the mood a little bit because it can be stressful at times. So, yeah, I think it's nice to try and make it a sort of happy and enjoyable place to be. Mm. So when you're relaxed, you're riding well, or how's your headspace before you drop in? Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I just, like, listen to music and then, you know, I just, like, the way I think of it is it's just dropping in for, like, a fun run with your mates. I don't really think of it as a contest, which I feel like that helps a lot. Absolutely. I love hearing that. Now, being from the UK, I'm curious. There's not a ton of mountains for people that are unfamiliar. There's not a lot of mountains to grow up snowboarding. Some snow domes. Where did you sharpen your teeth on your snowboard? Um, I think it was mainly from like going away with my parents and sort of riding in France. And then obviously in the indoor snow domes, like there's no, there's nowhere in the UK really to go snowboarding. So yeah, it was always Europe, but yeah, it's the sickest place over in Europe. Another thing I want to talk about, obviously everybody talks about your style. Like you've got our favorite style. When we watch the contest, you make it, I just want to say thank you for making it refreshing to watch contests and see dope style, good trick selection in a world of a lot of like air, ba- air babies that are just kind of like chucking into airbags and more acrobatic, you make it look good. So I got to ask, where do you pull your style from? Who do you look up to in terms of inspiration for style? Um, I think it probably shows that it's Dusty. So, you know, definitely Dusty and like Chris Bradshaw and all them guys that sort of grew up in Bear Mountain and the uh, Mammoth, like all that crew. Um, but yeah, I sort of like the sort of older style where everyone was like baggy pants and like wide stance. And, you know, that's sort of where I look for style. I don't really look at like competition riders for style. If you know what I mean? <laughs> that's amazing. Well, it shows your inspirations show through in your riding. That is so gangster to see, uh, X Games gold medalist like yourself referencing Chris Bradshaw as where you pull inspiration from. <laughs> it's amazing. What do you do? You listen to music when you take your run, and if so, what do you what do you jamming? Definitely metal music all the time. Yeah, like Metallica, Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, stuff like that. Just yeah, vibing out to metal. Wow. So comp time comes, you're putting metal on. Yeah, every day. Mm. When I wake up trying to go to bed, just metal all the time. Holy shit, Mia, your 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 score just keeps going up in our book. It just keeps it just keeps climbing. Uh so do you remember a particular song that you were writing to during any of your X Games runs? I think I was listening to Anthrax on the last run I did. Ooh. Um that's the only thing that I can remember. Most of the time I don't like pay attention to what I'm listening to. It's mainly just when I'm like in practice and then the music sort of just gets blocked out by my brain for when I'm competing. But I remember I dropped into anthrax on that last run. Respect. Amazing. And I'd imagine you need metal <laughs> at the top of the big, the, what's it like at the top of the big air contest? Cause that one just seems gnarly. You're not flowing through a slope style course. You're just dropping in and chucking. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's definitely a different vibe from slope style. Because it's, I feel like there's not as much pressure on slope style. Like you sort of do your run, you go for like a run through the park almost. But 
big air, it's kind of like all focus on one jump. And if you don't land it, like it sucks. If you do land it, it's awesome. So there's definitely a lot of pressure for that. Um, but yeah, X Games big air was crazy. Amazing. How much practice did you get in on that kicker before big air? Um, I don't know. I think it was, obviously it was part of the slope style course this year. So we got a lot of practice on it through slope training. But I think we had like two hours pretty much every day. So, yeah, it was um, it was a pretty stacked week. Mm. How'd you like the How'd you like the X slope course? Yeah, it was sick. Uh, couldn't have asked for anything better, really. All the rails were super fun, and you know, I'm not like the strongest quarter pipe rider, but I really enjoyed riding that quarter pipe. What do you What are your favorite slope style course? Like, what do you look for when you're like, oh, okay, this thing's hitting? Uh, I don't know. I think probably the rail sections. Like if there's a good rail section, like I get hyped to go ride it. Amazing. Now I got to ask, you're contest god and going to continue to be a contest god, but you got the rail skills. Do you see yourself getting in the streets and dropping A grades in the near future? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, I kind of want to just do the Olympics and then just go ride street and film edits with my mates and maybe do like the odd competition. But yeah, I definitely see myself just riding street in the future. Perfect. I love that. Amazing. And I saw you recently won, um, great Britain, like athlete of the year or something like that. What was that award all about? Yeah, that was, um, like I think young sports woman of the year and young sports personality of the year. So, yeah, to get that was pretty crazy, especially being a snowboarder. Like, in the UK, no one really knows what that is. So, for me to get that was, like, pretty mental. Yeah, and you're up against all the, like, soccer or football players, as you call them, and real, like, legit athletes. Yeah, yeah. And, like, like, obviously I do contests, but I wouldn't say, like, I'm an athlete, athlete. I just snowboard. So, for me to get that as, like, an athlete was, like, pretty funny. Amazing. Well, cool, Mia. Um, thanks for taking the time to to check in with us for this group chat. And uh, you got any more contests for the rest of the year? Are you uh, doing Grand Prix? Uh, yeah, I've got the Mammoth one this week. And then there's two more. I think I might be doing Dew Tour as well. But yeah, we'll see. Cool. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your winter. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. And congrats on behalf of all of snowboarding, congrats, because you uh, made it fun to watch. Thank you. Yeah, hyped. Okay, Mia. All right, we'll talk to you soon. You, bye. <clears throat> all right, we're back. What a legend, Mia Brooks. Bright future for her. Now, uh, I got to check in with you guys. You came in with a bottle of champagne. You guys were doing some mimosas. Where are we at with the champagne, Blake and Sam? Uh, champagne's gone. Crushed it. Nice. How are we feeling? Pretty good. Sharp. Yep. <laughs> Nice. It seems like uh, time to sharpen up with a run through a wall smelling salt. I mean, yeah. Okay. All right, buddy. Yeah. I must send you one Instagram. What, a so week. everyone gets a Percy or you? Yeah, with I, smelling salt, some sort of sports guys. Yeah, Chris, I, you got one of your own. I got one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here, let me hand one to uh, Russell over here. Does Does Blake have one? Give him a personal. Yeah, I guess we're all going Percy's. Give him a Percy. Yeah, I would say box. generally my Instagram is uh, people tagging me and people doing smelling salts. That's probably 90% of my DMs and who I should have on the show. That's, oh, yeah. that's pretty much my Instagram. Um, that's pretty sick, though. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Russ, why don't you take us? You want to put the sunglasses on for this? I might need. Yeah. I might need to go into prime. Dion, prime time. Oh, yeah. Prime time, baby. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Coach Prime. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Wow. I'll just go around the horn here. Okay. Oh, oh, wow, that was good. Oh. <laughs> How are the Mimosa boys doing over here? Oh, eyes oh. are watering. <laughs> Blake's, or, uh, Sam's hit. Sam's hit. I just want to do one and try I to keep a straight was, face, but you just can't do that. I didn't think it was that close to my fucking nose, but... Sam's hit. Yeah. <sighs> the uh, lights are so speak, much brighter now. Speaking of Coach Prime, did you see Shiloh Sanders snowboarding? I did. That's fantastic. He's already doing little, you know, little box maneuvers. Dude, get that guy on the steel. He's going to be a problem. Athlete. 
athlete. Zeb was with him already. He called Zeb out, too. Shout out to Zeb. That was insane. Yeah, let's check in with you, Russ. I mean, I uh, to be totally honest with you, I know you got one foot in fashion. You got one foot in snowboarding. What What's Russell Winfield? What is, what's going on in the life of Russ these days? Wow, so much happening right now. I'm super lucky and blessed and all that. I uh, own a creative studio, and I work with a large fashion house out of Milan, Italy. And I creative direct their ski slash snowboard winner, like Mountain Capsule. Um, obviously, I'm still with Arcteryx as a global ambassador, which is amazing. Ride. I uh, ride for ride. I have my board. Uh, I also work for our parent company, um, Elevate Outdoor Collective, and I do, like, access management. So we're working through, like, just trying to broaden the the culture of the outdoor the outdoor culture by um like allowing other people who might not look at our industry as a career right and it's not just for like minorities who want to be pro it's like hey if you like graphic design check this out or you maybe you want to be an accountant right? We, we have plenty of accountants. Maybe you want to work in the legal department. You know, maybe you want to be an engineer, you know? So I think that there's a lot of amazing programs out there getting underserved people to the mountain, right? Like a lot of them. And I've, for the past five years, I've worked with most of them um, and have been in contact with, you know, I'd have to say pretty much all of them, I I think. And what's next? Like, it's awesome to get these kids to the mountain, right? But what about the kids that had the same feeling doing our sport that all four of us had? Like that feeling in your stomach, right, where you're like, this is it. Like, not all of those kids are going to be pro. As a matter of fact, most of them aren't, right? But that doesn't mean that they can't be a successful part of our, even like the financial ecosystem, right? So we're working on some programs to get kids actually um, started in careers, right, Um, through this. And working with Elevate on that, and it's something that I think is, is super cool, right? Just showing people that there's other things that you can do other than what you've been told because of your location or financial disposition, right? Like, you, you can do a bunch of stuff. You can do it with anything you want, really, on, on the planet. You just have to put your mind to it and get a couple, you know, good breaks. So that's kind of what I'm doing. Amazing. I love that. <laughs> a lot that. of stuff. I, dude, and another thing that I just popped in my head, too, as you were talking, is last time we did a podcast, you came on the show is years ago, and – you were talking about Virgil, and since then, R.I.P. Virgil has passed. Yeah, rest and in peace. I would love for you to just touch on that subject. Uh, wow. Um, still super emotional about it. I had no idea that he was sick. Uh, I know people after he'd passed. There was people that I know who knew, um, but they respected his wishes. Nobody said anything. But he has helped me and a bunch of other people, like, so immensely just by plugging us in, right? And, like, finding the right people who he felt would represent properly, right? And be respectful and and hardworking. Um, And so I've maintained a relationship with his foundations. Like, I'm friends with his wife and a bunch of his inner circle and uh, he has, like, the, the Postmodern Foundation and the Fashion Scholarship Fund and now the Virgil Abloh Foundation, which is all around getting— and this isn't for just black people or minor. It's for everybody, getting young creatives into industries, right? And so I'm, actually, I'm going to uh, the gala where in New York in April 
where they have all of the uh, the the postmodern scholars and the alum come, and there's a you know I'll I'll be speaking with the kids, and there's like I'm like the small like it's the guy who's the head of LVMH, it's Peter Nordstrom, and it's some other super big person right they're like the keynotes but i'm gonna have i'm gonna speak with the kids they show their whatever their projects are and we have a big gala and they raise money um but i think that the biggest thing that virgil left all of us with is that it's about passing on knowledge and support right like and just in in general, right? Like the last time we talked, it was like, if everybody around is a good person, then in the end, everything's going to work out. We're going to all have differences, but because we're good people, we're going to talk it out and come to an agreement where everybody's like, okay, right? Like, and I think right now on the planet, it's like, if you don't think exactly how I think, you're wrong. And I don't want to talk to you. Well, that's just not the case we're not the borg in star trek where we're all one thing you know um we're different and that's what makes us all so special and makes us stronger as a collective right so um i guess to not be so long-winded i'm helping with all that um and i am just grateful that he tapped me and i'm doing the best i can every day to uh live up to to what i feel i need to do Oh, gangster. Love that. You're doing a great job. I saw a quote recently, a Virgil quote, and it was something along the lines of, everything I do is for my 17-year-old self. self. So sick. If you, it's such a good North Star for everything you're doing. Like, you're like, yeah, I'm, dude, I'm doing, I'm living my dream that I did what I would want to do when I'm 17, or my 17-year-old self would think this is whack, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, and I remember being a kid, and I got to a certain age, and I was like, you know, I can never fully grow up because when you, when you, you look at some adults and they were just like blank, right? There was no wonderment, right? They just didn't, they just, it was kind of like they had turned into a robot, right? There was no, and, and like, there was no pop, right? It was just like deadpan. And so I think that's like, when I hear that quote, that's what it makes me think of is like, keep that fire inside of you keep that wonderment keep wanting to grow and learn right and be better and you know that's that's like that's you know that's philosophy totally right yeah don't let adulting suck the soul out of your body because that can happen yeah i mean don't be a child either but well, like there's, there's a there's a spot you can get to there's a difference between being like the word childish i think is probably it's associated with being immature, but being childlike is that go. wonderment that you said. Yeah, it's like, oh, like I'm that. I'm excited about this thing. I'm fucking, I don't know why I'm building a treehouse in the backyard, but I'm going to build it. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hike around in the backcountry, and I don't know why I'm going to build this stupid jump, but I'm going to build it. And we're going to have fun. And we're going to have fun. Yeah. That's good stuff. I'm so curious what you got going on in fashion. I always see you doing Louis Vuitton stuff. And I'm, I'm like, you know, we're snowboarders. I'm lost in all that world. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny growing up in New York and in the city and uh, having a family who was in the dry cleaning business. I grew up around clothes and um, next to sports, like clothing has always been like when before I turned pro, I gra- finished high school and uh, went to School of Visual Arts in New York City to, and I was going to be a apparel designer. Um, and then, like, after the first semester, I got a call from Miss Straw, and they were like, hey, we want to turn you pro and, you know, travel around the world. And I was like, well, this one's going to have to wait. So, um, you know, it's just a testament to don't ever give up your dreams, right? Because this was, that was the original dream to work for, a fa- you know, a Parisian or Italian fashion house. And uh, now I am. And it's, it's, uh. It's pretty sick. Good on you. Well, I'm going to get into a Patreon question. This is from Jeth, J-E-T-H. Uh, Russell, I love your style on and off the board. What fashion trends do you think will go off this year? Go off as in be good? Well, I mean, 
for, I think it was a high snob that said, like, and this kind of plays into our industry, like, the brand I work for is, like, deemed quiet luxury. And now, I guess, out quiet outdoor is a thing. So I think that stuff, um, and this is, like, city-wise, people are, are going to make... The logos are going to be less. The fabrics are going to be better. Um, there's going to be a lot of, like, nicer outdoor hiking shoes pulling up, right? I think, um, obviously, the workwear thing's huge right now. But uh, I think, for me, I, I, I like to dabble a little bit on, like, getting a little crazy but for me it's more about like being like maybe conservatively stylish like I think like that I like something that if I look at it in 10 years it might look I might be able to date it but it still won't look bad right like I think a lot of people go so far like that like if you look at it in 15 years you're like whew I was on one but I think, like, timeless classics for me is really pretty sick. I mean, I think the shape and the silhouette will, you know, thin and broaden and become wider over time and at different times, but it's still, like, the same, right, really. What do you? Where would you say concrete sneaks with the cowboy hat on <laughs> over the headphones fits in as far as timeless? I think concrete sneaks. I think Sam is is a one of a kind, and I think it's fucking amazing. I think that anybody that has their own thing and runs it is so sick. It's like honestly, my favorite fat like style people are like little kids when they first learn how to dr- like when they first like. You'll find out eventually, Grendies. Your child one day will pull up on you in the morning with, like, two different shoes, both on the wrong feet. If it's a girl, they'll be, like, tutu with, like, some crazy hat with maybe ears on it and, like, some... You're, like, sick. Like, you put that on and they're just so hyped. I think anything that makes you feel good, like, go with it. So it's a lot like Coach Prime saying, if you look good, you feel, feel good, good, you feel, you feel good, good, they play, pay good. You feel good, you play good, you play good, they pay good. Yeah. But going back to the Shiloh Saunders thing, you got Shiloh Saunders, football player, snowboarding. You got Travis Scott, rapper, snowboarding. snowboarding. You got a lot of black, prolific athletes and rappers and celebrities and, and people of that kind of nature riding snowboards now, which we fucking never saw, ever 10 years ago, right? That, was, that wasn't a thing. Uh, do, you, do you see that rippling down, and, and do you see their uptick in more black and brown people strapping into a snowboard these days? Well, yeah. I mean, in all of these, uh, these organizations I'm talking about, you know, um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's apparent. And it's, it's just a, it's a fun thing to do. But, you know, to go out there by yourself – like being the only one and never being there is, it's like a white person going to the hood for the first time and not like being like, eh. you know, it's like, it's just uncomfortable and it's, it's a lot of discomfort. So when you put these kids in these groups and then they go up, you know, four or five times, they get the lay of the land, they become more comfortable. And then you're going to find the ones that really love it. And those are the ones that I'm trying to to latch on to, right? And, like, try to show them that, hey, you know, you don't have to only work, you know, go to college and work in a bank. You can go to college and, and get a job here. And then you can do this, right? So it's, like, just, you know, back to the access thing, like creating more access. And, you know, in the coming little bit with uh, Elevate, we're, we have some pretty cool stuff. Radical to hear. Okay, let's rip into some Patreon questions here. Uh, This one's from Benny Pellegrino, and this one says, Russell, what's it going to take for Zeb to film a full part? Can you give him a call let him know his fans need this to happen? What's your take on that question? Well, kind of along the same lines as we've all been saying, like, Zeb is doing his thing, 
right? Um, would I love to see a, like an actual full part? Absolutely. Am I going to see one? I don't know. I'm not going to, you know, I not that I can. I'm not, you know, the Burton or the Red Bull guy or anything. Um, but I wouldn't ever push him to do that. I think his path is so controlled from what I see by him and what he wants to do that if he wants to put one out, he'll put one out. I mean, for all we know, he's secretly working on one now. I don't know. Like, and, and that's no, don't, that's no T. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying something because I know something, but he could be. I don't know. I mean, the kid's all over the planet, always. So uh, I, can, I can shoot him a text and tell him that the screets are, are asking, but, you know, no promises. I, I got a take on this subject. So okay. I actually, in probably a very unpopular opinion, probably get crucified for this, but I don't give a shit. It's my opinion. Uh, might change it next week. Who knows? However, at this current moment, so Zeb, when you go ride with him, you go ride, let's say, for example, Mammoth. Every single person that's going up the chairlift that sees Zeb snowboard is immediately a fan because every time he's strapped in and he's going at something, it's fucking exciting. He doesn't, like I said to him when I was filming him, just Mammoth. I'd be like, what do you want to do? He's like, I don't know. So you're telling me the plan is there is no plan. And he goes down the, he goes down the run and he chucks in every different direction. And I don't think he even knows what he's going to do until he's getting to the bottom of the lip. And then he's like, it feels good to go left and flip this way. And it's just, it's incredible. So every time that he goes to the resort, he fucking gets an insane fan base just by anybody seeing him snowboard, A, which I think is highly impactful. B, his snowboarding style is spontaneous and lends itself to just, it's more of like just strap him in and let him go towards stuff. Where like him shoveling in the streets and building a rail, it's almost a disservice to like, he should have a crowd of people around him when he snowboards. He should, you know, like I need to do that because it takes me a long time to do a good trick. I need a fucking hundred tries. So I can like make myself look good in a video part by you know, going to the streets or whatever. It lends itself to certain different s snowboard styles, but he's the polar opposite where I think that he should just keep riding the resort and, and doing his thing. And it's almost a disservice to do a video part because it's, he can be as equally as impressive on a 10 foot park jump. Yeah. I mean, I still would love to see a video part, but you are correct. And that's to back before there was the internet when you, you had to get in a team van and actually go around and ride with people to yep. become popular. That's how we built Ride Snowboards. We got a crappy black van, and we just traveled around in it for a year, right? And we gained a fan base for the brand, um, and that's what he's doing. And that's, that's a real special way to do it because when you— it's like the difference between listening to music— on Spotify or being at the show. When you're at the show, you feel like you're now part of this because you actually were in the same spatial zone, right? And that's what he's got. He's like, he's on a war world tour, yep. bro. Yeah, and I would say like the spontaneity and the improv that Zeb has and the way he carry carries himself is like uniquely his. Yeah. And fuck it's it's infectious like you're saying like yeah we all want to see the video part but just being able to just like be at the same mountain as him and watch him fucking rip down the run is insane yeah. so i feel like it's like just we need variety you know yeah, variety is the spice of life whatever it's just like Ooh. yeah <laughs> it's like <laughs> what are we all supposed to just kind of like curate our little aesthetic video parts and make ourselves <laughs> look out like I love that, and that's what I'm, like, biased towards, but that st doesn't mean that there's not, like, a hundred takes you could go at snowboarding and to have someone like him come break the mold and be that popular. And at first you're just like, what the hell is going on here? But then to see, like, how much power it has and to see it keep going, you, like, can't look away. Like, we need that, and we need yeah. all different types of everybody, like, snowboarding in different ways, and that's just a great representation of, like, if he films a video part, great, but also, yeah, like... He's also doing a lot of, like, amazing stuff for the sport and for other people outside of, like, shoveling a spot in the street to do something, like. Yeah. Or even, like, at Peace Park last year, I think he was maybe injured 
or like he he had taken a slam one of the days before or something, but he was there hanging the whole time, and it was just like just an infectious personality, you know, like just someone that everyone. I don't know. You just want to be around him, and yeah, we need more people like that in snowboarding. Just like, have you ever seen him slam? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'd still be on the ground. He's up immediately. He's back up. The slams yeah. even a trick sometimes. Yeah. yeah it turns it into a trick halfway through. Yeah. I like the I like the music analogy because it's like everybody's been to a show. What do you do after you go to the show? You fucking download the music and you listen to it on repeat for like the next two weeks. You know, it's yeah. like yeah. The, there's nothing um, more infectious than seeing somebody ride in person that really is that inspiring. Yeah. Now uh, let's let's run through. We got a bunch of Patreon questions we haven't hit. Uh, let's hit. We got one for Blake here. This is from Keen Meeks. Blake Paul, what inspired just the goggles and letting the hair fly? Have you ever seen Blake's hair? Also, what kind of product we got in there? The people need looking to know. pretty good right now. Yeah, the people need to know the product. <laughs> Little fresh champ. Uh, hair sponsored by Sunbum Product. <laughs> <laughs> Pro uh, tip. Shameless. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I explained it in my bomb hole. It's just like I was watching Jake Blauvel. I think Ika did it. Laura Hiscari. I'm just like, looks good sometimes. To be completely honest, you're just it's and it's nice like. You you got your hat on, your face mask on. It's you're hiking up the jump. It's finally warm enough. You're just like I need to land this thing. Like put the goggles on me. I want to feel the wind. Like let's do it. You know what I mean? If I tomahawk, it's gonna suck. Like <laughs> let's like any sort of extra motivation to land it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's funny. It feels like contrived sometimes, but also like who cares? You know, you, you, he, some of the names he named: Ika, Lore. Hair, yeah. I mean, lettuce, farm, farm dogs, bud. The That's lettuce like is flowing. Organic farmers, yeah. hair farmers. Also, like, number one quote from Blake is, uh, "If you sweat, you die in the backcountry." So <laughs> he's yeah. got to keep it cool. You got to make sure you don't sweat out there. Temperature regulation. It's a temperature regulation thing. I got thick hair. Yes, so, yes you do. So you actually, you could almost say it's a function over fashion thing with that argument. It's I mean, functionality. I would say functionality for sure. I feel like you feel like tied up when you got all this stuff around your neck and your head and you got their hat on and you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you're not going to hit like a street rail in your goggles. Sometimes Sam did it, but you're like, it's like the, Only the, if you the, have the to. tighter they are on your head and the more you're just like can see and feel, I feel like it's better. Okay. So this sick. is a Patreon question from Lance Hacker. He wants to know, Sam, if you were a Harry Potter character, who would you be and why? Hagrid is OG gangster. Uh, <laughs> that's for sure who I... If, if I could be anyone from Harry Potter, you're probably Hagrid. I'm amazed at how quickly yep. he came up with that. Yeah, you had that one queued up. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm a big Gryffindor fan, but Slytherin's pretty sick, too. So. Sean Lucy wants to know, Sam, can you please explain the breakfast scene at Almost 7? Which I don't know what Almost 7 is. Can you name every pro snowboarder? Shout out mentors. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a mid- that's a uh, Can we yeah. give him a, an air horn or a uh, gun or something? So the Omo Seven is a hotel in Asaikawa, and yeah, fuck. All right, like Beyond Metals was there. Battalion, we got Sweet and Griff, Cannon, Mateo, Lucy. Uh, I don't know. I think I think there was probably like like Todd Richards was there. Ingemar was there. Buckman. Uh, Chad Otterstrom was there. Uh, yeah, basically, you roll into this Japanese, very actually not Japanese breakfast, very like Western breakfast. They had really good waffles. Mm. Just a really good breakfast, honestly. Great buffet. Um, but yeah, basically, every pro snowboarder in the world seemed to be at the MO7 uh, in January. Multiple was generations. Griff, there? Griff was there. I heard some, I heard Griff talking about the onsen, a lot of, a lot of dong out at the uh, onsen situation. Yeah, it's like pretty weird if if you're not pipe out. Like I don't know if I don't, I don't know if anyone went in there with their board shorts on. Like that would be disrespectful to the culture. Like mm-hmm. I don't know, that's insane. Yeah. But uh yeah. Yeah, you're just chilling with your boys in the onsen, you know? Birthday just suit. Respect gets mm-hmm. respect, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um okay, this is for Blake. Uh it's from Sten Coco. Blake, can we talk about the cheddar biscuits that come with the new ride contract? 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's in like the hundred millions. <laughs> Like super high That's up it, there. Bro. Yeah, can, we, yeah. can we throw it on the screen and we can maybe we could uh, kind of scroll through the docu sign and look at all the the uh, <laughs> terms. Six commas. Yeah, we could probably we could dig into it. I mean, you don't even want to look at it. It's just zeros forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, pretty good Louis Vito situation. Couple, uh, couple bisque. We had a question from Holden Barth about fresh champ and what it is. Uh, fresh champ. I think it was, um, Blake is currently fresh champed. Yeah. If you have a look at his hair, silk, make sure you well, some get a cut. Li- some people are listening, Sam. Can you describe his hair for the listeners that can't see the screen? Um, I will just say that it's full of volume. <laughs> it's got some buoyancy to it and it's light and fluffy. Yeah. Fre- the, sh- the fresh champs is like, it's like when you Glistening. shampoo your hair and it looks like frizzy and crazy though. Yeah. Like, yeah. Me and Hayden Wrench kind of coined that term. We One time we were in Logan, and we yeah, went Seth, snowmobiling Seth. one day, and uh, we went back to the hotel. We're like, all right, we're going to dinner in an hour. We show up at dinner. Seth uh, Hewitt shows up, takes off his beanie, and it's just frizzy, just puffy. And we're like, what happened to your hair? And uh, we were just like, fresh champ? And he's like, yeah, shampoo every time. Like, with the hotel shampoo? Like, it's smelling all crazy. And then... <laughs> It's got, you know, when you shampoo your hair and it dries, you look crazy for a couple of days. Yeah. So we started Instagram. I might pull it back up. I got to, I, I don't think it's been years since I posted, but. I hit a tag the other day. Yeah. See, that was fresh champ. Yeah, I hit a fresh champ uh, in Asaikawa in Japan. Um, probably on the Mint Tours fucking shampoo or some shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, Mint Tours. Yeah. So who were you, who uh, hosted you in Japan, Sam? What was the name of the group? <laughs> Mint M I N T Tours, I believe. Yeah. Mint yeah. Tours. All what? right. This is a we got another question for Sam Taxwood. This one's from Tommy Gesme. Taxwood, can you tell us the backstory of the shirtless board slide from Keep the Changes roll call? Which I think is your ender, right? First clip, actually. First clip. Um Yeah. Wow. It was a long time ago. Uh I think that was like almost like tw- almost like twelve years ago or something. But yeah, we were uh, we were in uh, New England, uh, I think That's like Mass. Right isn't... next to my where I grew up. Yeah, we were in Mass and big scary rail, scared to hit it, trying board slides for a while, was getting really frustrated, and I don't know. At the time, I was just kind of stiff and pissed, like a little aggro, a little kid, and yeah, I kind of just figured. I was so far away from like making it to the end of this rail. I was like, fuck it. If I take my shirt off, maybe like kind of like the Jeremy Jones effect with his back nine up at uh Flagstaff. Kind of like if you, if you take your shirt off, like you, you won't fuck it. You kind of got to like, you got to get it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's like no real rhyme or reason. I really regret ever taking my shirt off to be completely honest. Like, I don't know why I ever did that, but, uh, Colton Feldman and Derek Lever and Mark Wilson let me do it. So <laughs> if if they if they weren't uh, sick of my ass at that point, I guess I'll be all right with it. I also got another shirtless clip on that trip as well. I don't know. It was just kind of I was just kind of being a dumbass at the time. But uh, it's not broke. Don't fix it, right? Yeah, it was fun. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> made, made it made everything a little bit more entertaining rather than like serious, I guess. And maybe that's why I did it too, just to have a little more like comedic part of the trick i guess but yeah respect you know that's that's what we call showmanship that is showmanship's important we're talking about it yeah, yeah. we remember it yeah mm-hmm. it worked yeah i yeah i mean me now never do that again but at the time you know when you're young and you i guess whatever got something to prove i guess whatever you got some angst in that clip so yeah. much angst yeah. it's great you're a kid you're allowed to do that stuff yeah, yeah. Time and place. Yep. Yeah. All right. This is a, we're going to go to a bit of a hard hitting question here. Uh, and then we're going to take a call from, actually, not a call. It's a pre recorded segment with Todd Richards. But before we do, let's get into this Instagram question from Hello Darlings. A little bit of a hard hitting question. What's a great distraction or something you realized that was holding you back from peaking in your snowboard career? Russ, you want to field this one? I got this. Uh, well, uh, Partying for me was a huge one um, and really caring about what other people thought 
was maybe not quite as big, but uh, also big. You want to elaborate on that? You know, when when I'm out partying, I'm kind of out partying, right? And that's kind of what I'm doing. And uh, so a couple years ago, I decided to be done with that. You know, it's just, it's not for everyone, and I'm not going to go preach to anybody about anything because everybody's got to figure their own thing out. But for me, uh, I just make better decisions, right, and can show up better. So that's what I chose to do. Boys? Um, I'd say just, like, imposter syndrome, not believing in yourself, not trying hard enough. Maybe you're younger and, yeah, you're worried about what people think and you're just kind of like, oh, like, this shot's only going to be cool if it's like this and this or that. And then you just, you get older, you get more confident, you have that self growth, you become, you become self-aware, you like actually appreciate the trips you're going on and what you get to do. And you just make the best of the situation and you kind of just work smarter, not harder. I think a lot of like, a lot of it when you're young is you, you have all these tricks and you're trying to film them, but like you maybe can't put the pieces together to get the right shot, even though you can do the tricks. But as you get older, you start to realize how a video works or what kind of shot works. And you're like, oh, if I just do this, it's going to look the best. Or like, yeah, just not caring, working with the right people. Yeah, finding your crew, all that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to agree with the both of you. But uh, I think the analogy like be the ball and like allowing yourself to like to to let nature kind of take its course uh it's it's hard to like it's hard to just like go with the flow sometimes and you really always want to like drive the bus as much as possible and steer it in this direction that the you think or you have pictured in your head that is perfect but it doesn't always go that way and yeah i don't know like just being able to go with the punches sometimes is like the hardest thing to do. And yeah, I don't know. I, with, with all the injuries I've experienced over my career and the amount of times that I thought I was like done or so upset with myself or whatever, like usually those experiences are like the most like formative or like most, you know, like you, you gain the most experience out of like kind of the lows and being able to like take the low and turn it into something positive is like kind of the, I don't know, my biggest takeaway, I guess. Yeah. Oh, wise, wise words. I love, I love hearing that. I, I like what I hear when you say that. I think about like getting into the flow of life and not like swimming upstream, so to speak, against everything. Like shit happens. You take it as it comes. You get in the flow. And I always think of Happy Gilmore, which the, the, uh, the other pro golfer that he meets, he, when Happy meets him, he's like, it's a circle. Energies, all good things. You put the quarter in, it goes up and down, around, circles, all good things. Harness good, block bad. Harness good, block bad. Yeah. And as much as it's fucking hilarious, he's right. Yeah. He's right, you know? He's on He's on target with that one. Yeah, and I don't know, just, like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get in the car with that fucking cougar, dude. Like, yeah. And, and be ready to experience thing, things that you can't foresee. You know, and just be ready to be along for the ride and, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, snowboarding's crazy. We're talking about Talladega Nights, right? Yeah, get yeah. in the car with the Cougars yeah. at Talladega Nights. Never know. When he, Will Ferrell, <laughs> his dad is trying to teach him yeah. to be fearless and he makes him get in the car with, with the Cougar. cougar. Yes. yes. That okay. was a great reference. That was yeah, a great basically reference. every scary spot I've ever snowboarded on, I think about that scene. Chip, <laughs> Justin Keniston has like instilled the like get in the car with that Cougar energy to me, yep. you know? He's like, whatever, buddy. You, you wanted to hit this. <laughs> it's like you got to get in the car with that cougar, man. Like it's like all right, cool. Will Gu- guess like, so. Ah, <laughs> ah, I'm just gonna get in there. I'm just gonna drive that car. I'm just gonna get in there. I'm gonna drive that car. Ah, like at the top of the jump, you're like, ah, you know, yeah, puff that fucker up, puff that that's fucker up. One. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's my boy reference. In my opinion, greatest movie of all time. <laughs> Uh, you got to puff that fucker up is when uh, he punches himself in the dick before fighting. Um, Dude, and homie's kind of like sitting Donnie there Berger. like, he's like, oh, you got to puff that fucker up. <laughs> he's kind of just like, God 
<laughs> These are the tricks of the trade. When you're at the top of the wedge and you're scared, sometimes you got to puff that fucker up. Or get in the car with a cougar. Or get in the car with that cougar. Or maybe both. Probably both. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to cut to a quick segment with Todd Richards. Here we go. All right. We got Todd Richards in the booth here. He just talked about some boots last week on his Instagram. Big old boot rant. And I let's get... I, I didn't really... I didn't... That, like, snowballed big time. Okay. Elaborate. Well, the whole deal was, is, like, I was... I've got this pair of old DCs. Like I'm in run, I run my boots into the ground, and, and I can realistically say to you that I've had 15 pairs, maybe less than 15 pairs of boots my entire career because I run them straight into the dirt because I like, I like to have a lot of like flexibility, you know, that kind of like quote unquote old school feel. Um, so I'm on the I'm at the end of this pair of DCs that I've had forever. Like the sole is falling off the boot. And I just went to Japan and like I noticed one day when I was walking through the snow that my sole was kind of flapping. I'm like, it's cool when it's strapped in the binding, but it ain't cool when you're like post hauling through pow and your boots separating. So I was just like trying to uh, like figure out if I'm, am I the only person that is like this? Is, am I just this one person in the wild and everybody else likes the new type of really rigid no, I wouldn't say like super rigid, but definitely like a stiffer style boot than I grew up riding. And apparently I'm not. So what you're basically explaining is you're on the quest for the perfect boot. I'm looking for the perfect boot, but it's, you know, boots are so subjective because it's just like footwear. Like everyone's foot's different. Everyone prefers a certain kind of feel over another. And it's like, you know, so I'm trying to find what I kind of consider like this unicorn in boots at this point because there really has been a trend since I would say like the 2003, 2004, the boots have become significantly stiffer. Now, whether or not that has to do with the way boots are manufactured, who they're being manufactured for, and, you know, are they built to last, the material is different. And I just started to really think like I'm, you know, I don't ride as much as I used to. So why would I, and, and the average consumer probably rides like maybe 20 days a year, you know, the average person that's buying a pair of boots. So like, why would you have to go through the break-in period that takes months if you're like only gonna ride a certain amount of days a year? And that's kind of like what like started this whole snowball topic on, you know, for me to post on Instagram. It was really like, the Instagram was kind of like a plead to, crowdsource information of like, what do you guys ride? And, you know, it just went crazy. And I got all these comments and all these DMs and like, you know, ultimately I think it'll help out. Um, it might actually help the entire cause of trying to provide a boot that like has that old school feel with, cause, cause I think the biggest problem is now there are soft boots out there, but they're usually low end and they don't have the features that the high end boots have, whether that be insulation, internal hold down, the liner is significantly, you know, more an economical liner. Like you don't have like these like pinnacle boots, like from 32 or Burton or, you know, DC or whatever that have these super, super high end features on a boot that flexes like a low end boot. So I guess that's my quest right now is to try to like, how do I find that? How do I get all that? So where are you at? I noticed that your setup, you're running a a size nine and a half liner with a 10 boot or something? What was no, your? No, I've got, I have a size. So, I mean, I have a 10 foot, right? I have like one of my feet is almost a 10 and a half, pretty much. I think that just happens as you get older and you, we wear, we wear skate shoes our whole lives and we, our feet just flatten out and our feet get longer. So I'm trying to get the overall size of my boot down so I can, so I don't have to ride like a wider board because mm -hmm. I like to turn. I want to, I want to use a side cut. So I'm just trying to like, you know, I'm getting like a, t a size 10 liner into a nine and a half boot. And I argue I probably could get it into a nine because it, and it just kind of goes to me. It's like, it says, all right, well, these, the lasts of these boots, although a lot of boot manufacturers will say that, that each last is individual, you start to think about that and that's really expensive. So there are, there, there's shared lasts through a lot of the different models, which I get. It's, it's So a uh, shared last would be basically you get a size 10 boot, right. but it's a nine and a half liner and then it's, it's advertised as a nine and a half. Exactly. Or the opposite way, Got you it. know, and it's just, it's, it's one of those things that it's been happening in the industry for a long time. I, I'm not saying all boot companies do it, but it is pretty common practice. So I guess 
you know, it's, it's not uncommon to recycle your liners into a new shell. I think a lot of people do that because that's, that's the way you break it down. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't remember the last time I went into a store. Like I've gone in and like tried on boots almost every year because I know that this problem exists for myself, not for everybody else, just for me. And I go in, and I try on boots and I'm like, good God, this is really uncomfortable. Like it hurts. And if you get a pair of boots that doesn't hurt, it means that you probably, they're probably a size too big, you know, cause, and those will pack out to like a full, you know, half size bigger than they need to be. So yeah, dude, it was just like this thing. And, and like I said, it snowballed. There's like 530 comments on It's like probably my most commented on, well, no, the X games rant last year was probably the most <laughs> common, but, but this one's got like, it's, it's definitely got some support by a lot of people and it's really constructive comments that are on there. It's not just like, you know, eat a dick, you know, it's like, you know, these are, this is what I do. And this is, these are the boots that I've found have worked out. Yeah. And so, I mean, you have this, here's the, like, just for example, this is the 32, um, bomb hole edition boot. This is the lashed, lash uh, double boa, last du double boa, you know, regardless of if you like bow or not, it is really convenient to be able to just not use laces and, and dial things. And it's, pre it's pretty cool. But I'm starting to find that on a lot of boots, you know, and it's not just 32, there's a whole like Vans and Burton, like the toe box area is really, really wide. And so like this, like a size 10 boot, I would consider it to be like a, like that's a medium size boot, you know, maybe 10 and a half starts to get on the larger size, but like, you know, nine, nine and a half, 10, that's a medium. So that should be in a medium binding. And some of these toe boxes are so big that you're in like large binding range. And when you get into large binding range, then you that, then you have to sacrifice for the the width of the binding, but then you know, you've got that play and there's just there's just so many things that kind of don't match up and I don't know, like it's it just be really cool to number one, like I just want to find a pair of boots that works for me. Yep. And I'm I'm actually I'm riding the lashed right now. I'm also riding this Nitro team boot. I got some K2 Taro Tamais in the mail right before I came out here that I'm like, holy shit, like this, this boot has like all kinds of high end features in a really soft boot. So we're going to see like how this goes, but like, I'm, you know, I would be more than willing to help somebody. And I'm not even talking like, I'm the job sponsor or anything. I just yeah. want to help because yeah. I, it's, it's benefiting me, um, to kind of create a, create a boot that gives you that, like, like I like to tweak, dude. I'm old school. Mm -hmm. If you, if your bindings ain't squeaking, you ain't tweaking. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So like, I just want to be able to give myself an opportunity to go and, and tweak out some airs. Oh yeah. So you're looking for, you're looking for a soft boot feel right. that doesn't blow out. You're looking for a smaller footprint. So it's tighter in the bindings and less toe and heel drag. Right. Yep. And, you know, the thing that's interesting about boots is last year, I, I've had the opportunity to design uh, the diesel hybrid, a boot from the ground up. And uh, one of my biggest concerns was, um, was footprint, right? Mm -hmm. Like same deal like you, we talked about. And it's, it's really tricky. Like when you come up with a concept and send it to the factory, sometimes it doesn't always come back exactly like you like. And then a, a huge factor in that is that I realized in designing a boot from the ground up is tongue density. Yes. That, so, yeah. so, so when you're, you know, we, we went through maybe five or six renditions of the tongue where it's like, Oh, that's too stiff. Oh, that's a wet sock. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so tongue density. And then the the ribbing there on the side, like where your ankle articulation is, how far that comes back right there, that's a huge factor. So I've been kind of nerding out on how to design a boot myself, and it's it's tricky. It is tricky. It's and a tricky process. And the, the, that's the, I'm glad you said the tongue because I feel like there's a lot of boots that I – so I don't, I don't want my boot to be just a full wet piece of cardboard. Yep. I want it to flex laterally, and when I go from heel to toe, I don't want to feel like – I'm in a hard boot. And yep. like you said, the tongue is huge. Like there's a lot of boots that I've had over the years. Like, you know, especially when you, when you start adding the boa element into these, they get, it's so stiff. And, yep. you know, depending on where, you know, where the heel boa attaches on the tongue, that can kind of create this pressure point like right on the spot where then, you know, your binding strap is going to go over. So you're getting double, 
you know, the uncom- uncomfortability, especially on like colder days. So yeah, tongue articulation. Like I was such a fan of gel. Remember when like gel was like cool and everyone was using gel? I mean, I don't know if is the prices of gel have gone up. Yeah, I don't know the gel industry. Yeah. Uh, I think we should get in. I mean, you guys do smelling salts. I mean, there's no reason why you can't do bomb hole gel. Yes. But I'm thinking like get some of that gel because what it will end up doing is dispersing the pressure over a wider area. And I think that's that's really the whole goal here, especially with the tongue, is like getting that pressure to move around a little bit. Yeah, so you're you it's a it's a battle of not having a pressure point with having a a soft uh east to west flex mm-hmm. on your on your tongue density there. Yeah, that's I mean that's a that's a real challenge. It is a real challenge. And but I mean there's look, when I when I grew up like skiing before I discovered snowboarding, like ski boots you you just accepted that it was going to hurt. Like that was part of the whole ski industry was like, well, you know, it's going to hurt. And I can just remember crying in the lodge because my feet hurt so bad. And I'm like, this is supposed to be fun. But I actually feel like there's people that are buying boots and they're just kind of suffering through it because they just, snowboard boots are not cheap, dude. They're, they're the cost of like a snowboard, you know, 10 years ago. Like that's how much boots are. And if you pay that high end cost and you ride them once now you're committed because you've already got your freaking dank sweat from your socks in there. So you're committed to these boots and you just have to fight through the pain. Yeah. I don't think anyone should have to fight through something that is like arguably the most important component of the snowboard experience, yep. which is having comfortable feet. Totally. Uh, a couple of things that I think might be like worth adding for myself for boot setup is that um, I don't know if, what other brands. I've I've only ridden 32, so I'm I'm extremely biased towards 32. I'm paid by. What 32. did you ride in the beginning? When I was a kid? Yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't remember actually. I think I had oh North Wave. I got I was I was getting North Waves when I was a kid. Um, I don't even really remember the experience, but I've been on 32 for over 15 years. So, but one thing that they have is like the the heat moldable bind uh, yeah. heat moldable liners. So I go heat molded line liner, and then I have custom foot beds. And so that those two things, when you go get your your liner molded and you put in a custom footbed, right away, your your customer experience is better. Yeah, but not everyone has access to have, and you have to have someone that knows how to heat mold yeah, a shop. properly. Exactly. Yeah. And some of the things that I think too, like, you know, if you if you make a boot, you can't make a boot for everybody. But what you could do is to take a you know, take a boot that has the characteristics of a soft boot, but you can also like say that someone wants it stiffer. You can have some kind of like stabilizing element that you can slide into the boot to create stiffness with the tongue or with this or, and we're talking like point of purchase stuff now where you're just building out this, this boot program. Like I, I kind of dropped into in that uh, Instagram post that I run, um, a gel Dr. Scholl's underneath my bladder. So that goes, Oh wow. Yeah. So what, I've had heel bruises over the years. I haven't had heel bruises since I've done that. Then again, I haven't like cased a 120 footer recently, but like, you know, land flat for a long time and you, you know, your, your arches collapse and also you start to get like shooting pains and, you know, up your spine and I've, it's helped big time. Cool. So, you know, just little things like that, that can kind of make the experience of having a, you know, this, this really important thing, like number one, having your boots heat molded huge having an arch support because not only you know having you know i don't know who like super feet or shred insoles or some of these like high like to make sure that your arch is maintained because what that does is it locks your heel back in to your liner and also pulls your toes back so you actually kind of get a little bit more room in there when you actually do use a um appropriate uh insole for your boot and there's all these things that people don't really know about you know yeah and and i think that like what, what type of riding you do affects the type of boot you want. Like, for example, when I was filming my best video parts, I was running a really stiff boot. I was running like the Team 3. Even in the streets? In the streets, yeah. Really? I, I remember because, you know, when I when I had the Team 3, Stale rode this Team 3 and he got a silver medal at the Olympics and was doing all the rail tricks. And I was like thinking to myself like, dude, if he can, you know, he can do it in this boot, I can do it in this boot. And, and it, um, so... The one thing what I would do is like run it really I'd only lace it up halfway at the beginning of the year so it would break in and then by the end of the year come 
March, April, and I got a hundred days in this thing. It was perfect, you know. Right. And so, the, the, but the, there is the problem, dude. It's a hundred <laughs> days know, is what know, it took for you to get totally. your boot to feel good. But then you have then you, you know for somebody who wants one boot to last five years, you know you can start stiffer and let the thing noodle out. But that's the problem. You buy a soft boot and it's great for the first twenty days, and then it turns into a, a wet sock. And so there, that's the, that's also a, a challenge that, you know, and it's also like, you know, it's just, it's the nature of things mm-hmm. in, in our world is like every year it's this constant race to nowhere where we constantly have to upgrade. We got to do it better. So like you get used to a boot and the next year it's different. We're trying new technology or like a snowboard, like it, this is this crazy new tech. And you're like, but last year was good. And I kind of have like, you know, I'm a, I'm part of the problem and also like I start to think about it is like all this outerwear that we get. How many fucking black jackets do you need? And they're not really that different year after year after year. And the same goes for boots. It's like the double bow. Okay, now this bow is in a different place and now we have this super, you know, cinching whatever. And it's just like all these different things kind of happen. And if you're a pro athlete, you're required to promote that product. So you never really can like sit in something and figure it out and you always have to be like phasing on to the next thing and I think that's kind of a you know especially with something that's so important to the feel of what snowboarding is I think that's that's hard it's like a double-edged sword totally 100% I like that Uh, I mean that's a good that's a good concept to wrap your head around like we don't always need new stuff and and there's you know it's cool like Austin Smith's brand like season they do all black boards so you don't feel like you need to get the new graphic every year. And I think that that's a cool way to uh, think about consumerism. Um, Going back to boots, another thing thinking about, you know, I think would be interesting for the consumers to talk about is like what boot is for who, you know, like, again, I was going back to stiffer boots. Like when you are hitting big jumps and let's say a trick, like a back five front seven tricks where you come around on your toes and you, if you under rotate, I used to have wild ankle problems. Like I'd hot pocket my ankle because I came into a front seven a little bit under rotated and landed deep. And then you're putting all that pressure and you just hot pocket your ankle. So for me, the soft boots, I would have ankle problems with mm-hmm. when you go big. And so if you're getting after it and you're hitting big kickers, I think a, a stiffer boot is just going to be safer for higher impact. Yeah, and I think that, you know, there's – like the guys that ride a 22 foot deep super pipe now you you're essentially riding a race board and you need to have tons of stability like your boot is actually an additional high back mm-hmm. you know it's like this this one unit of like it takes all these g forces and you need to be able to transfer that straight onto your edge and and use that power and i definitely feel it when i get into 22 i'm like my setup is fucking whack yep. like this shit is not made for this but then again yesterday so i went up to to woodward park city and i rode an old school half pipe that's kind of tacoy and like really fun but like it's that you need that play in your boots in an old school pipe like that if your if your boots and board are too reactive it gets twitchy and that's you don't want twitchy on like tighter features so maybe yeah, if you're if you're riding someplace like the X Games or any resort that has big ass jumps, maybe you need to um, go more towards a stiffer setup. But if you're riding like I don't know, like back east or in the Midwest or like w- like Woodward Peace Park at Boreal or here at Park City, maybe you want something that has a little bit more play because you want to be darty and and you don't want like all of a sudden your entire side cut to engage and fly into the woods. You know what yes. I mean? Like that, not saying you're flying into the woods, but like it just, there's been plenty of times when I've been on a stiff setup where my my full rail engages when I don't want it to be engaging. Mm-hmm. And that's... Absolutely. I don't know. I don't know, dude. There's there's so many different options. I mean, you get the double ball. The one thing I do not like is this new dual speed lacing thing with this. It's like a freaking. You ever seen one of those Chinese, not Chinese finger traps, but like the the thing where you make the web with your fingers mm-hmm. with the string. Yep. There's just so many cords. Little cat's cradle. Yeah, situation. cat's cradle of of just and I don't know what am I supposed to do with this string? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Cool. Well, I think it's been a good topic. Uh, one last thing too, thinking about you talking about the soft boots is everybody always talks about soft boots for grabs and tweaks and it, but like for jibbing, you know, and buttering, especially buttering. Like you know, I grew up riding with Scott Stevens and Beresford, and our style is like East Coast. A lot of times, like every little undulation, we're doing a back one eighty tail scraper, a nollie three sixty butter, 
And you will notice between sto- like stiff and soft boots, the soft boot, you can get your board to go steep easier. You just have a bigger range of motion to manipulate your snowboard. So soft boots are great for down bars and rail tricks and butters and tweaks. Um, but then you sacrifice for the high impact, the ankle stability. And right. So. And I, I think that that's another thing too, is like, you know, I like my boards to be torsionally sto- soft, but, but tip to tail kind of stiffer. Yep. So, and I think if once you get that torsional flex, like the lateral flex on a boot gets softer, you, it's just more playful, mm-hmm. but that, that isn't for everybody. That situation, I mean, I don't know, like it'd be interesting to me to see what, like, I know like Travis Rice rides, well, he has a stiff ass boot. I don't know if he, that's what he rides when he's in Alaska. Um, and then when you, like powder comes into play, do you want a stiffer boot? Do you want a softer boot? Like, what do you want to feel? And this, I mean, this is so crazy because this is like, we've, we've come so far from like, when I, when I grew up, it was like ski boot liners and Sorrells. And then Burton came out with the, like the first real snowboard boot. And then we moved on to like two tongue Burton boots. So you could just, they were like, people were doing Japan airs and dropping their knee and dinging it off the deck. And like, and now here we are. Like we tried to get so far away from hard booting because that was just kind of like not what freestyle snowboarding was back then. But then I put on like some new, you know, newer boots and I tighten them up to where I'm, it's secure. And I'm like, dude, there is no difference between these and like a Reikly freaking, you know, <laughs> ski boot. Like there's not any difference here. So I don't know. I, the, the solution's out there. Um, Let's make something cool. And when I say let's, I mean me. Like, let me make something cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Todd. Well, thanks for coming and talking boots. We're going to get back to the show. It's been a pleasure. All right, Sam. What up, Chris? Let's talk about some stuff. <laughs> what, what, what do we got on the docket, buddy? Let's, let's get it going. Uh, a very official, fully funded, locked-in project that is going to be <laughs> One of the best projects of next winter oh, that is yeah. formally known with a long condensed media deck that has been fully approved by all brands, and it's called Screwdriver. Whoa. Yeah, a couple of uh, misfit toys out on an island trying to figure, uh, find their way through this this winter, I guess. And that would be Nick Baden, Parker Zumowski, Gabe Ferguson, and myself. Uh, yeah, we had a good time doing the brown thing with everyone the last couple of years. And yeah, I don't know. Obviously, everyone this year is kind of maybe has some different shit going on. But uh, the four of us kind of are all in the same boat and would like to film with each other. And yeah, stoked to uh, get out there and go do some shit. And whatever we come away with is what we come away with. And we're, we're, we're stoked to make a video together. Okay. Amazing. And so just to kind of like back up my intro, it was really kind of uh, – unconfirmed video but we're going to confirm it right now yeah it's uh, official yeah we're, we're, we're going to make it happen um but yeah it's a loose program uh low expectation high reward go out make sure we're uh prioritizing fun and uh doing doing us and yeah i guess that's typically debauchery sometimes but yeah just murder nice cold beers at times every now and then Nice. Now let's talk about. We got two uh, two of the marquee stars from Brown Cinema's Knights of the Brown Table. Uh, a lot of internet chatter. A lot of people, big fans of the Brown video. Uh, how are we feeling? Are the boys riding high? Are you flying a little too close to the sun? Um, you know how how is it? Uh, we're you know we're flirting the line. We're too close to the sun and <laughs> all that. Yeah, Singe get, the get, tips. Yeah, get close. Not too close. <laughs> No, it's, I mean, it was an amazing experience. Like, that was probably the most, like, it's, like, cliche to say, but that was, like, the most organic, like, project where people are like, oh, I want to do, like, a project with my friends and showcase, like, what we're all up to or showcase these, like, friendships. And not that it has a storyline or anything like that, but we just started all filming together. Butters kind of spearheaded it, and we just... It was like you're filming with your best friends all the time. Sometimes you got like 12 people out there just trying to make it happen. It wasn't like we had like a huge budget or anything. And what like came about of it was like pretty amazing to see the final product. And 
I feel like everybody that's in that video is kind of like in some sort of prime, whether they're up and coming in their prime, whether they're in like the prime of their career and just having the opportunity to film with like your best friends doing what you love that like feels like your purpose. It was like pretty rad to see. Um, and then also just having it be like unfiltered and including like the lifestyle of what goes on, you know? Yeah. And it, it, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to have like the foresight for like the, the post video situation, I guess, is like, I don't know, we've gotten amazing feedback and I don't know, for us to like throw shit at a wall and maybe it'll stick and and for that to actually kind of stick and hopefully, you know, like lived up to some sort of expectation was, was amazing. But in the end, like it was for us and if, if you back it, then that's amazing. But like no matter what, like we just... Yeah, it was just like a collective of friends. And, yeah, we're really spoiled to be able to have that opportunity to do that. So, yeah. I'll, I'll say this from the uh, fan point of this. When I heard what you guys were doing, I knew it was going to be fucking heat. Because, I mean, like the lineup was sick. And uh, it's just, it was, like you guys said, it was super organic. And it was... Like, some stuff seems real forced, right? Like, you watch it and you're like, eh, the tricks and everything was sick, but it just, it was kind of like, it was just forced. Yeah. And your guys' shit was like old school. It was just like homies out there getting it. Yeah, some stuff is just like too curated yeah. in a sense where you're like, oh, trying to trick the audience and that we're like these people that are like oh go hike up this fresh snow field and like let me get this life via you with the sun glare on your goggles and the whatever it's just like let's like actually showcase what's happening out here and what's going on and like let's not like sugarcoat it and put it out and make it entertaining like yeah and i think brock like brock nielsen <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Brock Brock just really tied it all together in, like, such a nice way. And, yeah, I don't know. He's definitely a pretty unsung hero within the industry, I feel like. And, yeah, that dude just deserves all the credit in the world because he's put, he's put his life and soul and heart into this shit and has been filming snowboarding for, like, 17 years or something now. And, yeah, I don't know. He just, yeah, thank you, Brock. Yeah. I'll say this. Um, amazing. I was hoping you guys would go just a little bit harder. I know, <laughs> I know how good every fucking single one of you. Not that it wasn't next level, but like you guys are all such good snowboarders. Like the best at that shit, right? Like all of you guys ripped so hard and it was so sick that I was like, damn, that was sick. But I know there was shit that they either left out or were just like, bah. I know it. That's like every video project you've yeah, done with right. it. You're like, yeah. it's cool. I'm proud of it. Could always be better. And a lot of it's conditions. Yeah. It's budget. It's well, it's man. Like, don't please yeah. don't take this no, as like no. me disagreeing. No, guys. I think like, I, I think it. what you're saying like, is legit though, yeah. because like, you guys are like it's like a scratch in the surface, basically. Yeah, like I'm know? like, like if yeah. these guys really if everything lines up fucking Travis's movies should really watch out because you guys are <laughs> I mean really I, good. I don't know about that but I do I, I, I will think say you guys are I will really say good, man. And though, not, you know. like for as loose of a program that we were running and the amount of you know like I don't know if our sponsors were really the most confident <laughs> in us throughout the process <laughs> you know mean. like yeah. uh, and I think that also goes to show that like yeah, for sure. We were having as much fun as possible, but we also were like waking up and going out every day and doing shit. And maybe it wasn't everyone was getting a clip every single day, but no matter what, like someone was doing something and someone was risking their life or whatever. And it's like not a company driven video. It's just like literally out of our, we just wanted to do it for us yeah. and for snowboarding and for anyone that fucks with that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I th I think we definitely could have flopped way. No, it, like it we could have flopped, not, and, yeah, and we did not a flop. Like, yeah. did you, Blake? Have you seen the old, super old school surf movie Momentum? 
Taylor, oh. like Taylor Steele's first surf movie. I don't know if I have. You need to watch that. Yeah. It's like young Machado and like mm-hmm. like young Kel. And it was like I saw I when I heard I was like uh oh here we go <laughs> like you guys yeah. yeah you guys crushed it. Sam looked a lot like Rob Machado on the sand. Yeah, I noticed. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sandboarding. Yeah, he does. Very pulling similar. in. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I got a question for you, real quick, Sam. Uh, this is an Instagram question from Off the Clock Industries at Concrete Sneaks. What's the biggest battle you had for your brown part? Did you have any ruthless battles where you had to go to war for Dude. a trick? Uh, wow. Uh, this is going to sound crazy, but brown, I, I was hurt, like, the whole time. I definitely, like, I wrapped my leg around the telephone pole in the video. That was probably, like, my biggest battle, just dealing with that, like, mental struggle and whatever, coming back from injuries throughout the whole process. But... Yeah, Brown, for me, honestly, was sick because I actually performed at a better batting average than than I have in the the past. Uh, But, yeah, it made it, like, more, like, the whole, my part, I guess, was just, like, pretty much crunch time or crammed into, like, a really short amount of time. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess just the whole project was a battle for me. But I'm just super fortunate to be a part of this, be a part of the video. And, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so thankful. Yeah. If anybody hasn't watched Knights at the Brown Table, go watch it. It's a hitter. Now, uh, I have another hard-hitting topic here. Um, it was on – somebody submitted this. I can't find it, but they wanted to know, uh, Blake, what's it like dating as a pro snowboarder this, these days? <laughs> <laughs> Fill us in. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's high highs and low lows. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sometimes – you know, you find someone you really like, you run it out, maybe snowboarding, you know, takes its course and it doesn't work out. It's just the tail as old as time, traveling all the time, never in one place. Maybe you're not as present as you should be. Um, but no, it's fun. You're around the world. You meet all kinds of cool people. It's like, enjoy it as it goes on. I feel like when I was younger, I was kind of like, not, I was just like, oh, like I got to. I need someone to support me and all that and you get older and you're like, let's just fly this thing solo and see who we can meet and have fun along the way. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. That's a ridiculous question. It's probably not as glamorous as it seems, but there's been good times. Let's try to wrap this show up on a fucking good note. And (laughs) and so we got uh, Jack Daw coming and Uh, he's got a great question, AKA the WEP. Um, And he wants to know, are Blake and Stax ready to try double corks? I think Blake's done a double. I never have, but yeah, maybe one day it'll happen. Uh, whatever the web wants, I'll do it for him. Yeah, we got yeah. it, buddy. <laughs> Dude, can I get a can I get a uh, B Proddy um, suggested clip that I want to see? Yeah, but you do the see. back the back seven melon is just you got that's so all day. Can you just can you just dip that thing in just another three sixty at the end, just on like a jacker this year? Yeah, probably not, but <laughs> let's, let's see what I can do. <laughs> I'll try it. If the jump comes, if the jump comes. Just, yeah, if it comes around, whatever. Hey, all right, let's. How about this? All right, you're on air. It's uh, I don't know what month it is. It's February it's now. February second. Uh, end of the year. Can I? Can we just get some claims going here? Like something where you claim it on air and you got to do one. Like stacks. Can I get you that to claim that you're at least going to try a double cork off a of wedge this year? I'll try a double cork this year. <laughs> okay, now ideally in your head, which one are you going with? Front ten, back ten, cab? Switch back side. What? Switch back ten double or nine? Jesus. S- either or. Mm. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a hope and pray situation. Like you know, we're going nine or ten. For the year. <laughs> oh, good point. Whatever. He's gonna do it on MFM jump. Yeah. Yeah, rocker gap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, can we not count the cab nine double under thing? That doesn't count. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's kind of like, it's like that's like a double backflip, isn't it? Yeah. I'm, we're not going to count that one for you guys. I've, I've done a double backflip. Yeah. That doesn't really count. So is Blake. Why does the yeah. Why does the WEP want a double court? It Maybe. shoots like a weird straighter when you shoot a still of it. Yes. <laughs> Just melon flat middle of your... Yeah. Uh, yeah. WEP can do them, actually. That's probably yeah. why. Yeah, why he's uh, definitely yeah. done a couple double corks. He's a little jealous. You no, know? what he's doing is he's flexing on you. Right yeah, that's, yeah, that's what he wanted us to get back to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Webb's got a double cork. So sick, man. All right. 
<laughs> I mean, is it fried that I've never done a double cork in my whole career? Like I haven't either. Yeah, Chris, have you? You have. It's not uh, what you do; it's how you do it. All right, Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the pub beers are kicking in. <laughs> it's not what you do. It's let's, how let's you hit do a it. fucking good one. Yeah, let's hit a good one. Uh, let's hit a smelling salt. Oh fuck! Oh, the yeah. last one was beast, bro. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, horny got. Uh, this is a good one from uh, GM Nuyen. Uh What do pro snowboarders do in low snow years? You're looking at it, buddy. Yeah. Talk yep. about what we're gonna do. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Check the weather. Uh, 12, 12 ounce curls. We still have a lot of people that want to hear all about uh, Blake Paul switching to ride snowboards. <laughs> That's what 90% of them are. Uh, still <coughs> still unsecure, unsure if he secured the bag. Uh, he's kind of dodged that one pretty nicely. Okay. Consummate um, professional. Oh, here's a good one. from. Uh, this is from Ninja. Ninja. Russ, <laughs> Russ, you ever drive around in a Volkswagen Corrado with a fax machine in the hatch? Love Ninja. That was before DocuSign, huh? Had to keep the fax machine on you. <laughs> that was pre-DocuSign. Fax and, uh, machine in the truck. <laughs> just in case something came through. I don't, I don't think it was a fax machine. I think it was maybe one of the original cell phones that I had in the Corrado. Maybe a fax machine, but I'm pretty sure it was a cell phone. Okay. Love you, Ninja. Hope all's well, bud. Yeah, I still like the DocuSign reference a little better. Did we only hit one? Case you got a contract? Yeah. Oh, two? yeah, let's hit one. Yeah, you guys already hit one? Yeah. I already yeah. hit it. You I'm, haven't hit one yet? I'm oh, crying. I've been reading. Oh, wow. How, how wow. many of these do you hit a week? <coughs> oh, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Look next to my desk. <laughs> 40 down there. Oh, Jesus. All right, let's let's uh, let's wrap it on a question from Big Air Jer. He wants to know trend forecast 2025. Uh, street riders specifically. He also wants to know about vaping and snowboarding. Um, what do you guys got? You guys want to start with vaping? Uh, what, what's vaping? Um, okay. <laughs> so that's a good Louis Vito dodge right there. Um, I'd say the forecast is uh, pants are going straight fit. Yeah, they're going to... Slightly s- boot cut. Get slimmer. I've seen, I seen some slimmer. over the high back, distressed... Maybe you're, like, screen recording your photo or video that you're taking, and then you're posting, posting. that with a little blur. So kind of avant-garde. Yeah, some, scar- some scarves, maybe a tight top. I saw Brett Kulas in, like, a Nocta tight top. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so- like buff, being buff is in. Okay, um, so Zach, yeah. is Zach, is Hale back in? Because he's getting pretty buff. I've been in the gym with that kid. He's a... Monster. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. he's he's bending bar for yeah. sure. Kid's a problem. <laughs> yeah, kid's a problem. I I think he honestly might be on steroids. Just seeing the amount that he can. And live. you love that because I mean, we know how you feel. Yeah, about yeah that. We, we know you back <laughs> steroids. I am, dude. You see, they recently came out with the thing. You're, you're new. I, I, all I get tagged in. Like I get seventy five tags a day. Not an exaggeration of like Olymp. There's a new Olympics with steroids. I saw that. Yeah, it's do, do not DM that to me. I've seen it seven thousand times. You posted more. it a couple yeah. times too. Yeah, and I posted for it. more. Really excited about it. So, um, but going back to that question, I got to take uh, for Trend Watch twenty twenty five filler, like filler clips. Yeah, like filler. Yeah, let, whatever. I mean, anything I've put out, <laughs> <laughs> action on the screen. Uh, put it in there. I don't know. Late, I will say street wise lately, fifty board slide. That's all anyone's doing. Um, hopefully, people start trending back in to just like hucking some tricks. But I don't know. It's I, I ride street, and it's really hard to want to like try try a fucking trick at a scary spot. So yeah, I don't know. It's Tech street, jar. Basically, Jed just owns the fucking street game. Mm. Yep. Did that switch back to he posted the other day not going his part? Correct. Did not. That's fucked up. Would take that. I would take that clip. Like, that would be my last clip. Yeah, I would retire. I would yeah. retire after something that didn't go in his part. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Jed. same. What about, I got I to gotta take, what about Blake in the streets? Pretty sick. He did a sick bush all he last yeah, year. Yeah, he had a street clip in brown. That's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I landed in powder. It's on top of a school roof at 7 a.m., though, crawling around. 
with lights on and using a bungee. That's kind of scary. But what about, I don't know. I don't even. Know, I don't think that's a real street clip. Nothing. Nothing like just feeling like a fucking idiot on a. Yeah, a business build. You're on top of the roof of some place you're not supposed to be, and you're like, "Yeah, I'm here to snowboard." <laughs> you're that's, like, yeah, fuck, that's like, like uh, I'm 30 years old, and like I'm just like crawling around on this roof, like shoveling uh, some snow. I guess I'm gonna jump off it and like maybe get a clip. I don't fucking know. Like, <laughs> like what the fuck, dude? It's insane. Like our brains are, f- we're fried. Like I don't. <laughs> I feel well, like that is one thing that I kind of forgot about. Like just. Being on, like, I was with Spencer on the last trip, and you're kind of like, you're just straight trespassing. You're all you're, day long. Yeah, you're kind of like, you're making a commotion somewhere, <laughs> and you're doing what shouldn't be done, and it feels wrong. You're like, oh, like, this thing goes into the middle of a street. I'm just going to start shoveling snow into the middle of the street right now in this small neighborhood, and people yeah. are going to start to get pissed. And you have to just, like, put your, like, mentality aside and be like okay we're like you we're play, trespassing you just we, play dumb yeah we're committing a crime essentially in some way maybe not technically and then some people are hyped and it works out but just snowboarding in that environment of like people don't like this and i only have a certain amount of time to do this and i might get kicked out i like forgot about that or because normally we're just like in the mountains only thing that can like prevent you from doing something is like avalanche can- danger or just like general risk but you're like in a beautiful place just like this feels natural this feels right this is why i snowboard but then you're like some old ladies like yelling at you in a different language because you're like throwing a little bit of snow on the street you're like oh i'm so sorry like but we have to do this i, I don't know it just feels like different and dude it you you're or for me personally i tend to get really i i get really frustrated sometimes at spots and so keeping your composure and not <laughs> acting like a fucking child <laughs> is really hard sometimes <laughs> like you're mad at the world because you're trying this trick yeah like abusing someone's property uh trespassing whatever what have you and you're like yeah i don't know sometimes it's just really hard to not feel silly about it cuz it's just like fuck that's what makes me want to go ride in the back country so much because Sometimes you're at a street spot freaking the fuck out for no reason, but, yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way, because I'd be in them streets. <laughs> <laughs> you going to get back in there, 2025, Russ? Yeah, let's go. Where let's, are we going? Let's fire it up. Let's fire it up. All right, guys, I think we did it on the show. Um, 341. 341. It's actually longer than that. I think we're at clear like four and some change. Jeez. If you're still listening, thank you. Uh, <laughs> wow. I'm sorry. I hope you ter- tuned out a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I think I blacked out halfway through. What happened? Yeah. All our sponsors, yeah. thank you. All of our Patreon members, thank you so much. We appreciate you. You guys, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank, uh, thank you, Chris. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. It's been a whirlwind of emotion. And we got another podcast coming at you next Wednesday. Over and out from the bomb hole.